Hello everybody, welcome back to Encounter Roleplay. My name is Will, I'm a DD sex icon, and I'm back today for another episode and indeed a new season of The World's Tree Burns. We're back with the full cast and crew. We have some new folks with us today to play some more games. So let's get into it. Let's remind ourselves of who we are and of course who we're playing. Let us go to our inimitable dungeon master, Dan Dillon. Dan, how's it going, my friend? It is going fantastic. I'm a little bit under the weather, but the best cure for that is playing some D&D, so I have the cure for what ails me. Uh, I am excited to be back. I've missed you guys. I've missed our wonderful viewers, and uh, as you said, I will be your dungeon master for this evening, and we have two new lovely faces with us. So everyone, please welcome Simply Jackson and Scarlet Moth. I'm super excited to have them playing with us. Oh, awesome. Uh, well, let's go and uh, let's, let's start off with new people then. Let's put them on the spot. Uh, so we have yes. Simply Jackson with us tonight. Simply, how are you going? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I uh, did a full work day. I got my car fixed and this is the highlight of the whole day. So you better be good. This better be awesome. I'm just kidding. Oh, good. <laughs> but, uh, I don't, do you guys do like the usual like I do this I do that kind of thing because yeah 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 I'm a, to, to, yeah, sure. yeah, okay I'm a variety broadcaster on Twitch I do art stuff if you ever want to come and say hi do that but I'm super excited I'm fairly new to the role play scene so go easy on me please so but that's it that's all I'm gonna say fruitful <laughs> of flame for you uh, no uh, it'll it'll be fun we don't bite except from Dan uh, but we have Scarlet Mock with us running to the channel how's it going Scarlet good to see you. Hello, I'm so excited to be a part of this game. It's, I've just heard so many good things about it, and I'm still catching up on season one myself, but shh, don't tell anyone. Uh, I am an artist, a cosplayer, and D&D addict. I have, this is my first day back at home because I've been at PAX uh, Australia for all of last week, and I'm just ready to get my D&D fix. Amazing. Great stuff. Um, well, let's meet the, the old tired faces that we're all used to seeing him on the channel that we really just roll them out now you know that tall school has a <laughs> kidding tall school, how you doing? yeah they drug me out of my uh drug me out of the nursing home to come back and play some more uh but uh, it's always great to be back here i cannot wait to journey back into midgard i uh have been a, a huge fan of midgard for like all my dnd &Ding. And to play here is always so much fun, and to uh, prance around in uh, the fun and excitement that is uh, Dan's uh, campaign, and especially with some new folks, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I am Tall Squall. You can find me all over the internet as Tall Squall, doing all kinds of stuff uh, on this channel and others, and my own. Uh, a and, resplendent uh, offering. Oh dear a lord! Giant donation just showed up, so thank you. And uh, yeah. Let's uh, get this. Uh, let's get this potato rolling. Let's do that. I'll take already fix it up for the nation. I'm gonna file it off to uh, to Dan here so that he knows what's going on. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that as well. Tremwire is giving the wild magic surges to uh, to the new players. We'll get we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, of course, we have McLoken with us as well. How's it going, Luke? Good to see you, buddy. Hi. That's all I got. No, uh, hey, I'm McLoken. Uh, I'm a uh, crazy uh, D&D player. I do a lot of role playing. Uh, I uh, do my own show. I'll probably talk about that after the whole show's over. Today I'll be playing Cloak, the lovable gnome ranger who knows everything and is honest and will do anything to save his puppy. Um, that's that that last part's probably the only true part to anything I just said. And simply, we've played in a game together uh, mm -hmm. a while back, mm -hmm. so you can't say you're new to role playing. No, Have here's we, the we thing. We played. A, okay. <laughs> Let me have this, McLookin. No, um, <laughs> I haven't played D and D since I was like 19. So I've done other tabletop oh, RPGs, okay. but but I will be the question asker of the season. So if you want to mute whenever I talk, it's totally fine. It's fine. No, we like questions. <laughs> we like new players. <laughs> I don't know the rules, so I'm just going to vicariously learn through you asking questions. That's my plan. <laughs> uh, Perfect. But, uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, before we get started, oh, I'll be playing Riordan, the Dampier Cleric. Um, who's just actually, at the end of last season, spoiler alert, he lost his best friend. Uh, Possibly his only real friend in life was Kane. No, Cloak's still uh, here. Well, <laughs> well, yes, darling, but uh, <laughs> that's. Um, <laughs> but he'd known Kane for actually hundreds of years, and, uh, and Kane passed away at the end of last 
uh, uh, session. So uh, Riordan is coming back a little bit darker. He's going through his Spider-Man free emo phase right now, and uh, I. One of the worst phases to go through, let me tell you. The uh, worst phase. Looking forward to it nonetheless. Um, oh, before we get started, as well, let's roll through the sponsors. The first of which is, of course, our good friends over at Cobalt Press. If you didn't know, this campaign is sponsored by Cobalt Press. Go over to their website, cobaltpress.com, and check out all of the Midgard materials there. We are playing in the world of Midgard, which Dan Dillon is about to transport us to. It's a good time. So definitely go and check it out if you haven't yet. Uh, it's uh, sort of darker, fancier than you might be used to on the Forgotten Realms. It's a breath of fresh air if you've playing, been playing D&D for a while and really, really enjoyable. Um, and of course, we're sponsored as per usual by FancyGrounds.com, our virtual tabletop of choice. Definitely go ahead and check those guys out. You can play on their, uh, their site for free with the demo version, and they have other licenses available as well. Then, of course, WaylandGames.co.uk is a go to destination for war games, board games, and minis, and so much more. So, definitely check those guys out as well. They sponsor and support the show. And last but not least, TabletopLoot.com give away a set of dice at the end of each of our games. So, stick around to the end of this one, and we'll be giving away a set of Tabletop Loot to you guys there in the chat. Who knows mostly it? Oh, here's the uh, sponsor. Thank you guys for all the subs and the sub gifts. Uh, there is the uh, tweet for you guys. 20 retweets. You guys get to decide something which happens next in our campaign. And of course, you can donate to the game as well by giving players that ones, that 20s, wild magic surges, and worse, as you already have done. But let's hand over the reins back to our inimitable dungeon master, Dan Dillon. Dan, do you want to remind us quickly a little bit about what happened last season on the show and take us into tonight's episode of The World Tree Burns? Oh, sure. Should we do like a kind of a shotgun recap of the season or just yeah. right where we left off? Let's, let's hit some of the highlights, you know, like 20 seconds. Right, sure. Boom. Yeah. yeah, sure. So in the first season of The World Tree Burns, our heroes who had been uh, adventuring together for a short time uh, were hired to recover some stolen property that was taken from the Arcane Collegium, which, if you're not familiar, is the uh, essentially the Arcane Magic College and uh, Brotherhood of Wizards, Sorcerers, and uh, Research Laboratory and Library in Zobek, the free city. Uh, they discovered a shadow cult that had turned to worship of the Shadow Realm and drawing dark powers from that uh, otherworldly place, that dark reflection of Midgard just on the other side of the veil. Uh, the individual who had stolen the book escaped using his dark powers, and after some deadly battles with his minions, both undead shadows and corrupted... Uh, uh, corrupted cultist uh, individuals, they recovered the stolen book and uh, soon came to realize that it was the account of one Werner Strauss. The Strauss family uh, of almost a century prior fell from prominence, but they ruled Zobek and all the surrounding lands. And they were a, a powerful human noble family, but they had made many pacts with darkness. And it is because of their dark streak running through their bloodline that they were overthrown. And as far as everyone knows, uh, pretty much the entire family was put to death and hung from the walls of their ancestral castle. Uh, the, uh, the, the adventurers kept a copy of the journal because our resident geomancer wizard, uh, Glazishin, realized that it was coded and there were hidden messages and formulae, uh, scattered throughout the journal. And so they engaged the services of a scribe, a certain shady individual, to make them a copy of it so that they could continue to work on it in their own time after turning it in and getting the reward. Uh, and so they embarked on various other adventures. They discovered an... Uh, a lost dwarven hold in the nearby uh, Margrave Forest called the Halls of Everforge that was being um, plundered by bandits and kobolds in service to a flame dragon, a Midgard-specific dragon, a, cre a creature composed of elemental fire and lava. Uh, and they thwarted it from opening a portal into the elemental plane of fire and uh, trying to... You're not exactly sure what was going on there. There was something strange. There was uh, there was all sorts of fire magic. There was planar incursions coming from the other side. But we solved all that with the tip of an arrow and the point of a sword and the arcane blast of uh, spell might. Slew the dragon and claimed a tiny little moat of pure elemental fire that you've come to know as the Heart of Flame that I believe Glazishin carries in a specially wrought iron lantern. It's a, just a little blue uh, perpetual flame. 
we go. Uh, the uh, they made contact with a smith who's descended of the dwarves that uh, ran the halls of Everforge. Uh, she's uh, really a good friend of the group now, being that they saved her life and have brought her quite a bit of business. She's an armor smith, and uh, she seems to have at least some sort of innate magics uh, relating to that fiery portal. Uh, Glazishin has realized that a ley line runs through there and has, I think, since bound himself to it, uh, so he can draw upon the innate flows of earth energy that pass through that line to augment his spells. Uh, is sometimes to disastrous effect, other times to uh, to really punch above his weight class. Uh, that dragon didn't know what hit him when some of those lay enhanced uh, spells struck it down. Um, let's see, you've had uh, dealings with the under the undercity of Zobek called the Cartways. Uh, you dealt with the black market and in in particular, there was a slave auction for these strange creatures known as ghost folk, brutish, pale-skinned creatures with jutting lower jaws and heavy tusks. Uh, they uh, effected an escape attempt, uh, which you thwarted, some of you within an inch of your life, but you were able to uh, at least kill uh, about half of the party and uh, forced the chieftain and the shaman or sorceress who had come to save him, you forced them to flee into the bowels of the cartways beneath the city. As time went on, you continued to investigate this journal and uh, discovering more and more about the strange dark magic that this enigmatic figure that you were pursuing initially was employing. It came to your attention that he was not only using shadow magic, but also calling on the power of the void. The void is the outer darkness between stars, that little bit of nothing that was left over when the universe was spun into being. and that nothing is somehow paradoxically alive and sentient and seeks to consume everything that is. The world itself, the universe, pushes every manifestation of the void away, tries desperately to expel it like uh, an invader in a, for in a, in a living body. <laughs> there were some, uh, some mishaps with scrawling void, void glyphs. Uh, all over uh, the table in the library of uh, the Arcane Collegium, but that led you through various means to discover where this individual was uh, practicing their magic. Uh, you'd made contact with some of the creatures that dwell in the Margrave Forest, the Alcide, which are uh, sort of a centaur-type creature, a mix of elf and deer instead of human and horse. Uh, you made peaceful contact with them and even made some uh, tentative friends among them. Uh, but once you realized that whatever this individual was doing with their dark magic was disrupting uh, large flows of magic through the world, you were uh, spurred to intervene. And that sent you riding north, three days north of the city to Castle Shadowcrag, which was once known as Castle Stross, was the ancestral seat of the Stross family. When you arrived there, you found it shrouded in this perpetual twilight gloom, even in the, the bright of noonday. Uh, it was very, very strange. And Cloak, who has taken on the path of the Horizon Walker, could feel a twist in the fabric of the planes, like the entire place was being pulled somewhere else or somewhere else was being pulled here. It was very strange and disorienting and disturbing. As you approached the castle, uh, you were surprised to find the walls completely unwatched and unguarded. You scaled the walls and found in the old bailey in the center of the courtyard a great black oak tree known as the Black Oak. Uh, and at the foot of it, there was that figure who's been wielding so much dark magic and who's been uh, sort of plaguing your thoughts and your steps. Uh, reading from these strange floating sheets of brass covered in void magic glyphs. And he was opening a portal to another place using this powerful ley line that he had subverted with his dark magic and his cultists in support around him. Uh, a fierce pitched battle broke out at the, at the roots of the Black Oak. And uh, after much bloodshed on either side, you managed to slay all of the uh, cultist support and bring the Void Speaker himself to within an inch of his life. And with his very dying breath, quite literally, he hurled a bolt of nether energy toward your friend, Kane, the, uh, the Dampier bounty hunter who unfortunately was not able to dodge the bolt and it struck him 
straight through the heart, striking him stone dead in an instant, in a, a moment of disbelief and uh, and stunning sorrow that settled over our heroes. Uh, in that moment, the Void Speaker gave the last of his life energy for that final strike, and as well to twist that portal to a far-flung location in Midgard, uh, a great lush forest at a at a, a, a wide rushing river and there was a creature there a towering being clearly something of the void you've known of it as a dread walker and it somehow pulled this aberrant creature from where it was in the forest to somewhere else a plain of dust and desolation and a lifeless barren land and so you gathered yourselves around the now cold body of your your companion for, for at least one of you, your closest friend, Cain. Uh, the owl companion that Cain traveled with for so many years uh, recently transformed into a, a strange sentient creature by the shadow magic uh, at play around it, flew off into the perpetual twilight gloom that's surrounding the castle and uh, you take a few moments you can gather uh, what fallen trinkets you can glean from your foes that you've slain that litter the courtyard as the strange portal collapses in the roots of the black oak uh, you gather a number of uh, valuable trinkets uh, in particular those brass plates um, those are quite clearly magical. They were floating on their own. Uh, the Void Speaker was drawing terrible dark power from them uh, to, to affect his, uh, his plans. And you also find in the, uh, the belt pouch of his lieutenant a little leather packet uh, that is sealed with wax. And a brief investigation shows you that it contains some sort of magical dust. So you can gather up all of these things and uh, you spend some time investigating the, the castle itself because you know it's not uninhabited, but everywhere you go, everything feels wrong. Your sense of time begins to skew. Uh, you can't tell if you've been here for three minutes or seven days or hours or anywhere in between. And uh, you get more and more... Uh, off put your skin is beginning to crawl uh, you getting the feeling that you're being watched everywhere you turn and every now and then you see these ghostly apparitions of people men women horses uh, shadow fey uh, twisted looking individuals these dwarves with sallow gray skin they kind of blink into being ghostly and insubstantial and just sort of move about the castle but almost like a uh, it's like you're watching a film set to the wrong speed. Sometimes it's too fast, sometimes it's too slow. They just sort of blink in and out of being. And the longer you stay there, the more erratic these apparitions begin to become. How would you guys like to uh, handle the aftermath of that, that strange encounter? Well, oh, Jay. <laughs> Gl Glass, you're uh, muted. Yep, uh, Glaz is certainly curious about this, but also um, having just seen uh, seen this giant creature. And just a quick question: seeing as um, seeing as uh, the, lo the location that I saw is very close to Casadega, which is kind of where I did sort of my some of my archaeology studying out of Bimia, would I have heard? I mean, of I mean. Sort of this legend of, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to say it, Yagardraketh. Um, I mean, we've we that name heard that name in the library. Right. Well, you heard it because um, you more saw it because I believe uh, Kari wrote it, sort of automatic writing, thinking right. back to her nightmare. She wrote it in this endless spiral that went off yeah. the page and onto the table, and those uh, those blasphemous glyphs began to burn themselves into the wood and rot the very substance. Um, you don't have any specific information on that name, although it does... I mean, you've heard... You've made a... A, a very minor study of the the dread walkers in the western wastes right. um, and it seems yeah. similar to that yeah enough to know that hey that was probably a dread walker and yes I, i'm very concerned about what we just saw my friends uh that is most certainly a dread walker but it did not seem to be Everything I have studied is that the Dreadwalkers are frozen, and that one did not look like he was very frozen to me. 
Um, and he went from wherever he was to somewhere else, and with all of this void magic, we saw how dangerous all of that was back in the library, and now these phantoms from the Shadow Realm that are inhabiting this place, we should not linger in this place. Remember, and I look to, McC I think, wasn't it McCloakin and Rayodan who got Shadow Sickness? Way back. Uh, it was, it was everyone two. but Lying you on. and Kari. It was everyone right. but Glaz and Kari. Glaz made a saving throw, and Kari does. A, Kari is right. at home. The, the touch of shadow. Yeah. Perhaps we will uh, find Kari ourselves. Kari is essentially um, in stunned silence, uh, mostly, and she's kind of gathering uh, uh, Kane's body uh, during this time and preparing it for transport out of this terrible place. Ray then will join her in doing so. He also doesn't speak. All right. Uh, at the, at that point, like as uh, uh, Glass is talking, Cloak uh, would walk up to him and um, it's a lot of bits. Uh, he would uh, you for the donation. Uh, look at him. And he's, uh, <laughs> Ooh. Uh, um. So, uh, question. Uh, is the Shadow Road okay now? Uh, okay. Glaz, you can open your senses to the ley line. Uh, as yeah. you do, you can feel it, uh, like I said before, building and surging and pounding like a, a, a massive river that has been very suddenly dammed. And is that pressure is just building behind the dam. The dam has broken, but somehow the river is still being diverted, but not as directly and not as strongly. You can feel it flowing all around you now, and that uh, that sort of mournful violin music plays all around you and gives you that just sort of melancholy uh, droop to your shoulders. And as you look around, you realize that whatever the hell is going on with this castle, that perpetual gloom that's surrounding it right now, it's very much tied uh, along with what was happening with that portal to the power of the Shadow Road ley line. It's being sort of twisted and pooled around the castle. The Shadow Road is, it is better, but it is not fixed. It is not well. Uh, whenever something this massive is drawn upon it it's like it's like a uh, an elastic uh it it springs back and forth or a spring it goes back and forth a little bit before it all settles down or a, a pond that once disturbed takes a while to again become smooth and tranquil we are dealing with I, that I, I, I i was just more concerned if it's still being blocked up because you know uh, but I understand that it's gonna fix itself after a while, but yeah, I think we should get the fuck out of here. I, I agree. It seems as though the blockage has is not as it was. It is a, um, well, uh, to put it in layman's terms, uh, it, uh, it, it took a big, it took a big poop and now it is feeling better. <laughs> oh, glass. Uh, I mean, let's I see. Uh, Cloak, you have to kind of activate your portal sense, right? Uh, that's yeah, not just sort of. Yeah, I can do it. Let me let me double check something because I think I sure. can only use it after a long rest. Let me see. Now where is it? There you go. Uh. I can't get it back until I use a short and long rest. I don't know if we've been in a short rest. I, don't, I, 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 I think it's been a couple you, minutes. You guys have not taken a short rest, most certainly. I, I can't remember if you actually actively use the sense or if I just sort of gave you a freebie because of the... Uh, uh, I think I just kind of gave it to I, you that everything was all twisted I and freaky. I actively used it. No, I actively used it because uh, I was trying to locate uh, where the disruption was. Right. So That's what right, we you got did. here... Does it, yeah. does it last any particular time, or is it just kind of a once and done? Let's see here. Detect portal. Uh, 
looks like it's a once and done. Okay. Um, yeah. So I will tell you that that sense of pervasive wrongness in the planes that's just kind of prickling on your skin, it's starting to get worse. Mm. Do you now feel those, that? Uh, those, those pins and needles prickling at your skin, they're, they actually feel icy cold. Like, oh, okay. Um... Yeah, I think we should go. And I don't know, something, everything just doesn't feel right. And I don't, but we gotta get Kane out of here. That's gonna take time. And you know, I don't know what else to do. Um, we avoided a lot of things. We avoided the weird dwarf people. Um, you know, um, we're, yeah, right. We just need to go. I think we need to go back. And I, I think we need to see what happens, I guess. I agree. We need to... This is not a good place for us to be right now. There's nothing more we can do. And we have... He looks down at Kane. Some of our own business to, do, to deal with as well. Alright, so you guys yeah. are taking a leave of Castle Shadowcrag? Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you find the escape just as uh, as uncontested and easy as your ingress to the castle. Um, you can tie Kane's body in a blanket or a, a bedroll over the um, the saddle of that strange uh, reptilian mount that he'd recovered from that destroyed Marodi Empire. Uh, caravan that you'd come across on the way here and then just sort of lead it and it'll follow you. It seems to be a well-trained mount, uh, despite its very strange and almost alien nature to most of you. Uh, question. How is Puff yeah. Puff reacting? Puff Puff, uh, when you guys get, you left Puff Puff outside the castle, if I recall. So when you get outside the castle, you can actually oh, yeah. unbar the gate from the inside if you want and just make your make your exit that way. No one tries to stop you. You don't even see any actual physical corporeal living people. It's all just those strange images out of space and time uh, blipping around you. And as you're leaving, some of them start to notice you. They start to kind of look in your direction, although it looks like they kind of look past and through you. So whatever's going on here, it's either getting worse or it's reverting to normal. You can't tell and you're not sure which one's better. Uh, so you throw the, the massive bar on the gates aside and push them wide, and you find Puff Puff sort of pacing back and forth. Uh, the hackles on her golden fur are raised, and she has this kind of nervous drool rope pouring uh, out of her jaws, and her silver eyes fixed on you, Cloak, and she you can just feel the relief as she sort of yowl barks at you and lunges forward and starts licking your, your face and mask. <laughs> So you guys, can, uh, you guys can mount up and, uh, and ride away from here as quick as, as, quick as your, your animals can carry you. Red and definitely does this, yeah. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll make the, the three-day trip and such back to, to Zobek quick. Uh, it is essentially uneventful. Uh, as long as you guys stick to the road, even going through the Margrave, you can feel that, uh, that sense of... I hesitate to say sentience, but that's close to it, just sort of pressing in on you in this dark primordial forest. Um, Glaz, anytime you bring the Heart of Flame out, if you ever use it to light your way or open the shutters on it, you immediately feel this, this almost this wave of animosity towards you. And so it kind of gets to the point where you realize you want to just sort of keep that stowed mm. and uh, tuck it away. Because it, it seems like the forest away. very much doesn't like it. Yep. No, all right. I think so, the forest uh, likes fire. Yep. You uh, you I all make your way back to Zobek. Uh, you make your way back to Zobek, and uh, you. Uh, how do you? What what disposition do you want to uh, to to give to Kane's body? What what arrangements or uh, or you know, what do you want to do with yeah. that? I think me and Kane. Uh, I would. I would. Yeah, I would look but, at Reardon and look for that info. I mean, like, well, absolutely. What, what do you want to do? Yeah, he hasn't spoken since know. um since the the, the trip back. Um and uh during the course of the arrangements probably doesn't say much aside from sort of short clipped instructions on what he needs people to do. Um and he probably just finds um yeah, he finds a like a crossroads just outside of Zobek before we come back into the city properly. 
uh, because he knows that Kane was a uh, bounty hunter and always uh, sort of walked the crossroads in his life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really simple affair. You know, Kane wouldn't have wanted any, uh, you know, real pomp or ceremony. So I think Riordan uh, sort of, you know, wordlessly watches his friend uh, go, go six feet under. Um, just on the just the side of a crossroads, and okay. uh, he so, doesn't okay. he doesn't say any words. He's he's not able to 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 say anything. Uh, Kari will probably say a few very simple words. Uh, it, it probably amounts to um, uh, a testament to his life, how he lived as a hunter, and now his hunt has ended, and others will carry the hunt in his place, and. That's pretty much it, and and she uh, she might place a token like uh, the claw of an animal or a, a fang of uh, one of the the beasts that you've slain you've uh, you've slayed in your uh, your travels uh, on his grave as a marker, and that's it. So he's left with a a very simple uh, functional grave at a at a roadside on the crossroads just outside of Zubek somewhere, and uh, and you turn back to your lives in the city. I probably leave my uh, my my family symbol. Uh, okay. With him. Uh, while he the wasn't last... a member, while he wasn't a member mm -hmm. of your family, he was he was the next best thing. He was close to it. I mean, you grew up with him, essentially thinking of him as Uncle Kane. So. Uh, yeah, so, the, yeah but that... I think by the end he saw him closer to an older brother. Um, sure. So yeah, he uh, he leaves that with him. And. The, uh, the peculiarities of uh, races that don't age quite as we expect them to, uh, as as humans. Yeah. Uh, so you you start you, you I mean you knew him as a child and then as you grew he didn't he never aged and so you just sort of got closer to him in uh, maturity and uh, and social standing and all of that rather than both of you continuing at the same gap if that makes sense. So, uh, you all return to Zobek, and uh, you find yourselves settling into a period of peace and quiet, uh, as far as it can be in, in the free city. It's, uh, it's a loud, noisy, bustling place full of life and commerce and clatter, and, uh, but it, it's almost shocking going from uh, death lurking over your shoulder at every turn as you have been for for so long now to uh probably a, a period of several months of normalcy and uh, so how do how do you adjust to that what do you what do you guys do for that time anything in particular just kind of give us a brief overview of your your time following the events at shadow crag um, I think Laz, feeling very guilty, is going to help repair their little uh, room that got destroyed that uh, for the uh, kettle whistle, uh, right. and uh, probably going to do that. He also has uh, a couple of spells uh, that he can that he's going to spend his time transcribing uh, into his uh, spell book, uh, ones that he had recovered from out of the um, the Strauss family diary that he. Uh, didn't have uh, time or funds or means to be able to do that now with a, a little bit of extra coin um, or coin that he wasn't willing to spend before. I think he is thinking he wants to spend it now, uh, sure. realizing just how ugly that fight got, that these are things that he probably should uh, try to put in there. Uh, I, I'll let you know which ones I do. I'm not, I don't have enough to do all of them. I'll probably just do one, That's which fine. is going to be the uh, uh, And I assume Bowl. you're going to be... Over the course of the, uh, the 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 few months, you're going to be continuing to tinker with the the copy of Strauss's journal that you have. Yep, I will continue to tinker, and then I also uh, I'm going to go and uh, take up our good buddy. Uh, I've got it right here. Um, our good buddy, Master Diviner uh, Rudwin Whitstone's uh, mm -hmm. uh, counsel, and present myself the to the collegium to, to join the collegium. Um, All right, and begin. Uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. That process. All right, cool. Uh, all right, so that's what Glass is going to be up to. Uh, how about Riodan? What are you going to be up to for the next uh, next couple of months? Yeah, Riodan does not cope well with the the death of uh, of Cain, perhaps because their lives are so much longer. The period of grief, uh, which they, they oversee, at least for Riodan, is a lot longer because pretty much as his last family member. 
So Riordan uh, falls to pretty much all of the vices that he could fall to, uh, drugs, alcohol, prostitution, uh, at the uh, uh, place that he lives in. So he, I think, lives a very destructive life over the next few months and uh, hides himself away from Glass and uh, Cloak and never uh, returns their calls to, to visit one another. Uh, he's... Um, by, by the end of it, uh, he's probably lost all of his uh, worldly goods and money, and uh, his body is probably not in a state like it should be in for for someone who's an adventurer. I see. So are you going to uh, basically ignore the shrine to Morena that you keep under the soak scabbard as well, and just sort of ignore that? He forsakes religion. I think he <clears throat> forsakes okay. religion, and that's a big part of his... Uh, a uh, big part of his life being a cleric, so he loses his connection to uh, his goddess. And so, so he, he, he isn't stops really praying. a cleric, I guess. Yeah. He stops praying, he stops casting spells, he doesn't reach out to the divine at all, and just loses himself in the distraction, the noise, the pleasures of blood and flesh. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you ever at any point in your, uh, your self-destructive death spiral... Uh, take the Requiem that you guys had found. Maybe, does he yeah. have that? Do you I have that? Actually, I think he. I think he does. I think I know. Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> or, actually, yeah, I think that, I mean, you have it on you, um, either for, to sell it for other stuff or take it yourself. I believe that you ended up with it. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Man. As a quick reminder, Refined Requiem is this um, sort of off-white crystalline, very fine crystalline powder, um, almost like if you ever get the very fine-grained sugar, not quite confectioners or powdered, but just very, very fine-grained granule sugar. Um, and it has this strange earthy smell, and you know that it supposedly opens your perceptions to things beyond the world, um, but is also highly valuable and highly addictive. Absolutely. If anything, that's an addictive yeah. substance. Uh, and Raydan's got a really addictive personality, so I think he's just... Vi you know, he's, in a, he's in a stage of his life where he is making all of the wrong decisions even when the right decision is presented before him, and he's in that okay. spiral of being I'll unable just make to... A note of that, and we will come back to it. <laughs> all right, so, Cloak, uh, how, are you, how are you handling your, uh, your couple of months in the aftermath of, of those adventures? Uh, well, he would uh, spend part of the time training Puff Puff to uh, be a, a better fighter and some someone he can like depend on and not like die in one hit. So okay. uh, doing partly that, uh, partly going to the library and doing copious amounts of research. Um, probably subject, going with Glass. Any subject in particular, or just sort of general. Uh, same thing with uh, tracing the the dragon and all that, but uh, the the study of planes and like the different planes, and then mainly oh, right. uh, the the different roads that are in Midgard, um, and got how got they got roads, uh, roads in particular. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and anything that they can do. Um, or uh, well, actually, uh, no, never mind that part. Uh, so, um, but he would go with Glaz when he goes to the Collegium. Uh, he's not a part of the Collegium, but he's like an acquaintance of the Collegium, I guess. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, would talk to the Master Diviner with Glaz, uh, help re uh, replenish the home that we destroyed, uh, sure. or the guest bedroom that got fucked up. Um, and then uh, he would uh, talk to Paula Everforge to see if he can uh, work on getting a magical saber of some sort um, or uh, imbuing magical properties into the saber that his, uh, his family saber um, okay. and uh, doing stuff like that. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else I would like to do. Um, Probably uh, helping the Collegium if they need uh, anyone uh, as a guide, uh, doing guide missions for them at all as well, mm -hmm. uh, just because that's what he did, and he's been working more closely to the Collegium, so 
guiding like new mages to like their like test area and making sure that they arrive there safe and back and that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. Sounds good. That's uh, that's a good chunk of stuff to be doing. Uh, Kari, you will see her. Those of you who keep in touch with your companions will see her frequently for perhaps the first few weeks following the events at Shadowcrag. Um, she doesn't stay in the city terribly much. She tends to stay outside of it in the outskirts. Um, she kind of falls back into some of her older patterns before you all settled in to your places at and around the Silk Scabbard uh, with the events surrounding this journal. Uh, and then after that, you start to see her less and less. And then after perhaps a month and a half or so, she sends you a very curt message that... Uh, her queen has called her home and her skills are needed on the other side of shadow and that she will never forget all of you and to always be vigilant in your hunt. Never forget that you were the hunters, not the prey. And, uh, then she is gone. Right up. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Cloak, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, so Rowan, it's winter. The sky is leaden gray overhead and the clouds are low. The snow falls deep in the Northlands and you are learning at the feet of your grandmother just outside Wolfheim. There's a village nearby. The village comes to her for help when they absolutely need it, most of them. Your kind are looked at with suspicion and awe and fear because they know that you're the eyes and ears of Wotan. You are the feathers of thought and memory fallen to Midgard and given form and flesh and will. And they know that any of their secrets at any time could be taken to the Rune Father for what purpose they can never fathom. Perhaps sometimes it might weigh on you. It might sadden you that other people see you thus but but as time goes on you at least come to terms with your lot and so up to you to decide whether you uh resent this or whether you find some peace or place within it but your grandmother teaches you she teaches you herbs and remedies she teaches you how to watch the signs in the flight of birds particularly in corvids ravens and crows that are so beloved of wotan the Rune Father. What is uh, what is your childhood like growing under your grandmother's tutelage as a as a wise woman? Uh, Rowan's childhood is at times bleak, and it's strange, but it's never seems strange to her. She's learnt to find find futures in in the entrails of of the dead and is quickly taught how to create her own divination tools from the bones of the uh, recently departed carving runes into them uh, in honor and under the tutelage of the all father the rune father and Very good. She comes to terms with the fact that others will never look at her lot the same way. It's almost wise of them to fear them more, be suspicious since they are the chosen of Wotan. They are the eyes and the ears. And upon her feathers is his will. Very good. So that realization, when she comes to it early, serves her incredibly well as she grows. Because while there is that thread of respect and awe that follows the Raven Folk, there is just a healthy dose of fear, misunderstanding, and mistrust that follows them. Because despite everything the Raven Folk do and are, they are to an individual thieves. They're always stealing secrets. They'll nick uh, little shiny baubles like the crows they so resemble. Uh, they will scatter them around their homes, little bright bits of ribbon taken here and there from something dropped from unsuspecting passers-by, something that will be overlooked and never needed. Uh, they're not malicious, of course, uh, but it's their nature. 
And so you spend your formative years collecting the secrets of those who come to your grandmother seeking her wisdom and seeking her her remedies. They they ask for assistance in love, they ask for cures for illnesses, they ask for help in childbirth when the other midwives aren't available or if the person in question is an outcast or a pariah of some kind. And you see many, many outcasts and pariahs that come along the, uh, the low windswept hilltop where you and your grandmother live. Your grandmother is a wise old bird and she delights in recounting stories of her long life to you, often using the voices of those who came before and those who played parts in these stories to tell you of the events rather than her own. It got to the point that sometimes you actually forget what her voice sounds like because she speaks with so many others. It almost becomes a game to see if you can get her to say something in her own tongue. I feel that that's a game amongst younger raven folk as well, using their mimicry mm-hmm. almost exclusively. It is exactly, and as you as you grow, you come to see the wisdom in it that it teaches you to. Uh, as you steal those secrets, you steal the voices that carry them, and those themselves become tools in your arsenal. Uh, both because you know that everything you learn will one day be returned to Wotan's lab to add to his knowledge, the knowledge that he snatched out of the very void itself, where others fear to look definitely fear to tread. He stared long and hard at the cost of his eye, some say at the cost of his life, hanging in the branches of the world ash for days, dead, and then returning to life with those stolen secrets. It, from him flowed the rune magic that uh, is the stock and trade of certain persons of power in the Northlands. And your grandmother passed along just a few of those secrets to you as well. As you grew in your connection to the rune father, you began to pray to him in your voice and others, and he began to answer. And it is as you reach into adulthood and into age, your grandmother passes away and you burn her body as is the tradition on top of that windswept hill, not too far from your home. And you, though you mourn her passing, you rejoice in the chorus of cause of a a murder of crows that passes overhead as the ashes of her pyre is picked up by a phantom wind and blow out over the mountains. And you know that everything she learned and everything she gleaned is going home, as it should. And you find yourself simply settling into life, taking her place. And you begin to offer your wisdom and your remedies to those who have aches and pains, those who seek curses against their enemies. Those, that's often a difficult business because the person asking the curse usually is the one that pays the price. And you try to warn them, some listen, most don't. They're blinded by their hatred or their desire for revenge. And so they pay and you intercede with Wotan on their behalf and you let them to their fate. It was their choice after all and you warned them. You see many more of those outcasts and brigands and outlaws who sometimes need something and they know that you're the only one who can provide it. And that offers you a measure of protection even from these uh, bloodthirsty individuals. You know that should they strike against you, not only will the wrath of your people with whom you keep in touch. They move about the Northlands in a sort of loose network, but the wrath of the Rune Father will fall on them, and they know that too. They know that killing one of Odin's, Wotan's eyes is a tremendous risk, and very few people are willing to take it unless given absolutely no other choice. And in fact, one did try to seek some form of vengeance upon the fate that I had told him, giving me the scar across my own right eye, which in turn only made me more feared as Wotan's voice. Yes, that one foolish assassin. You never really understood what his purpose was. You assume he was angry about a foretelling you'd given him. You cast your your rune bones one time for this individual, this pale-skinned, 
dark-haired figure, uh, not a native of the Northland, someone from the South, you think. But they, he spoke your, he spoke the Northern tongue fluently enough, and he had silver and gold to pay you for your services, and so you offered it. And you warned him of a great calamity that would one day befall he and all of his plans and all of his blood. And he became enraged at this, and he stormed away. And then he returned a few nights later, trying to perhaps forestall the hand of fate by slaying the, the beak that spoke the words unto him. You're not sure. All you know is that the scar is testament to his failure, and the village, whisper what they will behind your back, are all the better for his uh, blade's inability to find its true mark. You never saw him again. You never heard of him again. But you remember one strange thing, just this image that sort of echoes over and over, and that was his obsession with your blood. He kept saying something about he was there for your blood and only your blood would undo what you had done. But he failed, you live, and the world turns on. In the nearby village, Tilly, your earliest memory is a fire. And not, not a house fire or, or a campfire, something in between. A great fire that dominates your memory of this event. It was warm and you could smell the wood smoke and something else, something deeper and more pungent, perhaps some sort of herbs or roasting meat. There is a sense of sadness surrounding this fire, not from you, but from around it, perhaps from other people. You don't really remember other people. This is your very earliest memory. And you just remember feeling like that sadness, you could, you could displace it. It could be your place to push that sadness away and bring something brighter in its place. And that's what the light and warmth of that fire meant to you. The driving away of the cold, dark sorrow and leaving something brighter to show you the way. Years later, as a, as a young girl, an adolescent, work, uh, living at your mother's side, your father, long gone, you don't even remember him. Uh, your mother tells you stories of him often, so despite never knowing him, you feel that connection. And you see his, uh, his weapon hanging above the hearth, and every time you look at it, it brings you comfort. Uh, when your mother tells you the stories of his prowess in battle, his acumen on the high seas, uh, there were few reaver captains who could navigate by star, uh, by moon, or even just by gut feel the way your father could. Your mother was a leather worker, tanner by trade, Despite that, she is the best shot with a crossbow in your village, and she sees to it that you're taught. She sees to it that the men and women at arms of your, your village take you under their wing and under their shields and teach you how to carry yourself and survive in this world. And if there's one thing the Reaver Dwarves know, it's that you have got to take your survival at the edge of your blade, at the, the head of your hammer, at the, the, the haft of your axe, because the world isn't going to give it to you. You have to take it. Okay. So how, tell me about Tilly's upbringing in, uh, in her village and uh, with her mother's tutelage and her mother's stories of her father and where she came from and the warriors and militiamen who, and sailors who, uh, who teach her. I think uh, Tilly's um, childhood and early adolescence and even young adulthood coming into who she is now is just riddled with stories of... Um, loss and greatness and um, battles that m many, many Reaver Dwarves previous to her generation had fought and um, had to learn the idea of braving death, but in the same time relinquishing the fact that life is life and it's going to be fruitful and wonderful, but you almost have to 
face death in order to feel the um or be brave enough to deal with war and fighting in order to taste how good life is going to be um so ray is close with her mom and close with her people in her village and the people in her um kin uh there's a lot of uh celebrations with them and a lot of parties a lot of um seeing off many battles and um just it's it's a very family oriented feeling within her um tribe of people so she she learned that um connections are really really important uh and that that livelihood of her family and her tribe uh and her clan she will uh defend like hands down and that livelihood, of, of course, comes, as all things does, at the, the tip of a spear, the edge of a blade, and at the tiller of a ship, because she's a reaver dwarf, which means as <laughs> soon as she is old enough to pull a rope, as soon as she's old enough to maintain, maintain her balance on the deck of a ship, she is out on the icy waves of the Nieder Straits, uh, around the, uh, the, the coastlands of, of, uh, of Wolfheim. She is learning to sail, and as soon as she is able to carry a shield, she is placed on those ships, ready to do whatever she has to do. Now, she doesn't see her actual first battle or action for quite some time, until she's in her later teens. Um, and when she does, it's a sudden raid in the night. It snaps her out of a dead sleep. There is screaming of death and shouts. There's the orange glow of fire spreading through the village, the smell of smoke and the sound of clashing steel slicing flesh and breaking bones. She takes up her shield and without thinking, snatches her father's hammer from the mantle mm -hmm. above the fireplace and wades into darkness and death. And in that night, she is blooded in her first battle. She sees enemies die at the end of her weapon. She sees friends die under the blades of her foes and terrible foes they are, a raiding band of trollkin. Trollkin, creatures of fear and terror who uh, strode out of the darkest nightmares and tales of the ancient fey and giant folk who mingled their blood with humans and dwarves and other creatures centuries back into forgotten memory and until now they are what they are they are the trollkin but mm -hmm. even in the midst of all this even seeing your friends comrades die even seeing these creatures die under your blade and watching them burn to death uh, because their their bones knit, their flesh mends, and you know that you have to burn them to kill them for sure. And you use that terror they inspire against them, because they fear fire above all things. Because they know it's their undoing. In the wake of all of that, holding a uh, a burning brand in one hand, with uh, the shield strapped to your left arm and your father's hammer resting against your hip. You don't feel malice or hatred toward these these creatures. They're living their life just the same way your village lives theirs. This, this was a good battle. These were good deaths. There's honor in this, and there will be honor for you and your foes. And perhaps you'll meet them again one time. You might even drink with them. You may mm -hmm. fix them in battle. You may kill more, they may kill you. But such is the way of things. Yep. As time goes on, you eventually captain your own longship. And on one of your first voyages out, you set upon another ship of reavers and you and your men and women acquit yourselves with skill and bravery and surprise. You take them out of the fog. They had no idea you were coming and they put up the best defense they could, but before long, the ship is yours and the captain lies bleeding and broken at your feet. He coughs this bloody foam from his mouth, from a punctured lung where your hammer shattered his ribs and drove it into his innards. And he takes the shield off his own arm and looks up at you through his glassy, dimming eyes and looks at you with this anger and regret, but above all, a feeling of respect. And he pushes the shield towards you, coughs once more and then dies. And the shield is a battered uh, round shield with a silver veneer with the hammered 
image of a raven on it. And somewhere along the way, that image had taken a great sword stroke or perhaps an axe blow, and there is a rent through the image of the raven cutting across its left eye. Mm-hmm. So you claim the shield as your uh, as the memory of your perhaps your greatest victory in battle and in raiding, when you cl- you attacked and took your first ship of reavers, that led to taking a village and that led to prosperity for your people for the rest of the season. Perfect. As you moved on through the years you became acquainted with the old wise woman who lives up on the hill. Many of your people feared her, some of them respected her, but almost every family you know of within your village has sought her assistance at one time or another. Some of them hypocrites, some of them just quiet about it. But you saw something intriguing in the old raven folk who lives up in the stone thatched roof cottage up on that windswept crag of rock and you came to rowan more and more even instead of going to the uh, the priest of thor who uh, who oversaw spiritual and times divine intervention for your people in your village and rowan this dwarven warrior from one of the villages uh, down in, down near the coast you see her more and more over the years, and you watch her grow as she uh, she grows into young maturity for a dwarf, I believe. I don't think Tilly is terribly old at this point, is she? No. no. I would say, like, early 30s and human years kind of thing. So, sure. so yeah, that sounds good. So, uh, she... Anytime she has an issue, or if she has perhaps a problem in need of talking out, or uh, wisdom, or sometimes just in need of a friendly ear, or just someone to talk with about anything other than whatever's going on in her life, more and more she finds herself at your doorstep and your threshold. And at first you maybe thought she was one just like all the others, but over time you realized, no, this one's different. There's an acceptance to her, and she never gives in to the prejudices about the raven folk and she listens uh, intently to your stories and your tales as you bind one of her wounds or uh, provide her a poultice or a medicine for her or one of her people's illnesses and uh, so, so how do you how do you two sort of uh, interact and and w- in what way do you maybe bond over the course of uh, course of years as a sign of uh, respect almost Rowan starts to uh, refuses to cast cast the shaped knuckles and refuses to read the fate for Tilly she sees that as the sign of respect to let someone have their own fate untold and forge it for themselves interesting Tilly what about for your part um, I think that um, she feels as if she has to remain strong with her own kinfolk and has to not necessarily speak about any sort of weakness or fears with them because she wants to stay strong for her mother and she wants to be strong in battle and she's not sure about um, letting that go too much and the who are the who are the raven folk gonna tell so she at first i think goes to them to speak to rowan about these things essentially to hope rid herself of the weakness but i think after time with rowan has learned to accept it um through their friendship and i think in tilly's nature uh might even bring small rewards from any sort of pillaging that she has been able to go on to Rowan. Just small, small collection, small, tiny bits of bubbles and bibbles that she could pick up to give to her nice. as a as a thank you. Because I mean, it's respect. You have to you have to pay for the time, you know. And she sure. was always taught that from her mother of the ravens on the hill and stuff. So. Uh, I would imagine, <laughs> Rowan, that you appreciate those bottles and trinkets far more mm. than something as simple and low as coin, right? Mm. Rowan appreciates worldly items. Well, not not necessarily coin or valuables, but things with history, things which tell of of the world and have 
have stories to tell. And even even then, she seems to gravitate towards some of the more macabre items, well, bones or things from from the dead, not necessarily shiny, attractive silvers and golds, but things which have stories that sing in their bones. And so whenever you bring Rowan uh, some of those baubles and trinkets and spoils from your raids, Tilly, she is always very appreciative of them. And you can see her beady eyes light whenever she sees another one of the brightly colored or shiny things that you brought her. But she mm-hmm. always asks everything about where it came from, who had it, how did you get it, where did you find it? And she seems to... Uh, she seems to thrive on the stories of the things as much as the things themselves. And so you pick up on that, and as time goes on, you start to very carefully collect those details for her. Yeah, I think I think Tilly would enjoy that, considering she's from a clan of storytellers who speak of legends of their own people. She's kind of enjoying the fact that she gets to relish somebody else in her own stories of pillaging instead of it being always foretold to her by other people. So Very cool. It's like her own little sessions of being like, and this is what we did. <laughs> yep. 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 So she's she's a little bit of uh, it's almost like listening to your grandmother again in a way, Rowan. Listening to the stories of Tilly's uh, raids and adventures that uh, that that come to you, mm-hmm. and, and Tilly almost becomes something of a confessor, although that's not exactly the right the right term. Uh, you came to terms with your your lifestyle and your your way of life here in the harsh Northlands long ago, but something makes it uh, feel more real once you tell the story to someone and you know that that has passed on and uh, that that link of those events has been created and so there's a there's a great deal of mutual uh, appreciation for these story sessions words pass things into memory and words make things more real and words are the birth of thought into the world so as time goes on, word comes of war from the south. There's always some sort of war to the south, particularly if you're in the Septim, the Seven Cities. They are always at war with one another. This is different, though. This is the blood principalities pushing into the northern kingdom of Krakovar. This is Prince Lucan making his bid for an actual king's crown and throne and the vampires aided as the stories say by the darakul the empire of intelligent ghouls that live beneath the surface of midgard come boiling up from the south and driving into the north into the kingdom of krakovar and they slake themselves on blood and flesh and terror and that to you and your people tilly says opportunity Mm -hmm. Not only does mm-hmm. that mean that those fishing villages and uh, and shipping ports on the northern uh, the northern uh, coast of the of central Midgard will be ripe for uh, for the taking, they'll be sending troops elsewhere. They'll be distracted. They'll be afraid. They'll be tired. Perfect. But there is absolutely no love lost between the vampires of the Blood Principalities and the Dwarves. So that means an opportunity to slice some Shroud Chewer necks. And that appeals greatly to the followers of Thor and Wotan. And so you pack your ships with supplies and you prepare to head south into the war to see what riches and mischief and stories and glory and honor you can take at the head of your hammer and the tip of your spears. While these preparations are going on, and you excitedly uh, pass them along to Rowan, Rowan, one night after hearing uh, of Tilly's preparations to head to the south, you cast the bones, as you do often in front of the fire, in the the gleam of your trinkets that you've gathered in sort of the, the aura of the stories that cling to them, and you see in the the simple wooden tray before you where the the knuckle bones with their carved runes clatter to the world weathered surface you see a sight of the future usually you get bits and pieces glimpses flashes of insight that sort of thing this is a sudden and shocking vision 
before your eyes. You see blood spatter out under the knuckle bones, staining the wood, running down the edges of it onto the table and dripping onto the floor. You can smell it, coppery and thick, in the air of your home. You can hear it pattering to the stones. You look up and you see, staring at you, gleaming in the light of your fire, a silver raven with a great gouge across one of its eyes, and you recognize it as the image emblazoned on your fr- your young friend's shield. It tilts its head at you, its beak opens, and this deep, resonant, booming voice echoes out to you. All hinges to the south. Go. Find the last drop of Osgray blood. And then you blink as those words shake your bones, rattle your mind, and cause your feathers to stir. You look down, and the blood staining your your rune stones, your, uh, your floor, your table, the tray, all the blood is gone except for one of the runes seems to have this crust of dry blood in the carved rune. Which ruin is it? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, dun, dun, it dun. is... I know the one in my head, but I don't remember the name of it. One sec. Looking in the book, sorry, everyone. Uh, you find it in the rune. Awas, the yew tree, or Yggdrasil. This rune. Oop. All bad. There it is. Oh, very as, uh, uh, Pardon the ZZ top. <laughs> <laughs> and so, after this vision passes, you're left in this sort of state of shock. You've experienced these kind of visitations from beyond once or twice before, never anything this clear, never anything this powerful. And it leaves you a little bit shook and shaken. And it has a clear connection to Tilly. It seems to. It was the emblem on her shield that delivered the message unto you. She sort of just clicks and warbles to herself. She ends up uh, making more bird-like, raven-like noises when she's deep in thought. Kind of clacking her beak and Mm. calling softly. And so what do you do in the aftermath of that uh, that premonition? It's going to definitely ins- inspect the rune a lot closer. It's almost sniffing, tasting the blood. Trying it's, to see uh, what, what portent it has. You can you can smell the uh, the iron tang of the blood, although it's very faint. It it doesn't really have an edge, uh, and as you look at it, it is sort of um, dry and crusty, like an old stain or a scab. It I... tastes dead, like old. You just you know what I mean? Just that old, mm. dried, crusty, nasty blood. I need to tell Tilly, and I will set off down the hill, gathering my gathering my uh, belongings. Immediately, or in the morning, or immediately. Immediately. All right. This this cannot wait. All right. So you make your way down to the uh, down to the Reaver Dwarf encampment. It's a few miles away. Uh, you can see the fires glittering in the distance as you approach, and uh, it's probably at this point very late at night, a little past midnight even. Uh, and as you approach, there's a wooden palisade up on a uh, sort of a, an earthwork berm. 
that uh, defends the village from the landward side. And there's guard towers here and there along the wall, and you can see dwarves, dwarf men and women, uh, some bearded, many braids, lots of uh, gleaming metal armor, uh, crossbows and spears at the ready. You can see many of them uh, as you step into the light of the torches and the, the great braziers that burn to keep them warm uh, and keep the darkness at bay. Uh, they challenge you as you approach, but when you identify yourself and uh, say that you have business with, with Tilly, they deliberate amongst themselves for a moment. You can see a few of them giving you just coldly suspicious looks, but it seems that cooler heads prevail and the gate is open for you. You've been here a time or two before, so you know your way around. It's been a while. Uh, a few things have changed, but not enough to, to throw you off your way. And you make your way toward the Tanner's house, where you know Tilly and, uh, and her mother live. And you find yourself at their doorstep. You can see uh, the symbol of Thor carved, old, weathered, carved above the, uh, in the, the door frame. She t takes her um, her old gnarled staff and just and knocks at the door. Tilly, you hear late one night. Uh, you should be asleep. You're leaving in the morning with the tide. Uh, you should be uh, resting and preparing for the voyage ahead, but you're just so damn excited. You haven't been able to put out the fire in your belly and the excitement in your head. And so you're, you're in one of those fits between sleep and wake where you've kind of been bouncing since sundown uh, after making your preparations and you hear the pounding at the door. Dink, 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 dink. Um, Tilly will probably make sure her own mother is still asleep and not awakened by this because she is you know, she a little bit older. She's sleeping, like, sleeping like the dead. Okay. She doesn't notice. Probably snoring a lot because Tilly does too. But um, <laughs> Tilly creeps to the door and will curiously peep out like a side window or something instead just 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 in case to make sure that it's not anything that could be a threat. Okay. Um, uh, I'm guessing Rowan, do you want to describe yourself? Because we haven't done really a, mm. a, a description for our, our so, players and listeners. Rowan is a very old raven folk. She must be at least over a hundred and she has the scar across her, her right eye where it's become milky and almost blind like Wotan himself is one of the first things that you'll notice about her. Then you'll see that she's dressed like like a Nordic wise woman in blues and greys and very old cloth with bones and trinkets hanging about her, braided into her feathers. And she has molted arms where they're just old and gnarled and wrinkly. But she seems wise and seems in her own way kindly. All right, so Tilly, you can uh, answer the door and perhaps describe what Tilly looks like for us. Okay, so at this hour, Tilly is not going to be in her full set of armor, but she does have an uh, ironclad set of armor. It's weathered with battle, many scars, many dents, many dings. Um, at this point, she's still going to be wearing just a little bit of her undergarment, not undergarments, but her clothes beneath it and light, light leather, light armor, light kind of clothes. She has uh, ashy brown hair. Um, she was unable to uh, grow a full beard herself, not disappointed in such, but she ended up um, braiding her own hair down around her face uh, as if it were a beard, because um, one of her favorite things is being able to stroke that long braid whenever she is in thought. Not often, she's she's more of a jovial person, but um, around the clasp of that at the base of her chin, it's a, um, a large metal ring, one that's um, different from the um, metals within her own armor, but still weathered in itself and forged um, to fit that clasp around her uh, hair. Uh, she is, um, like we were saying, a younger, um, mature but younger dwarf uh she is not um muscular by any means she enjoys her ale and her delicious fatty meats as much as she can and um in general just seems rosy cheeked and uh freckles abound and um a a, a welcoming face um in general so and she's on the shorter side of the dwarf so okay because you got so 
<laughs> so Tilly door, opens. Door opens. Yep, the door opens. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, so Tilly opens. Rowan, what are you doing here at this hour? Tilly, like we must go south. What? Your shield. Just... Where, where is your shield? I mean, I have to go get it, but what what are you doing? What did you, why do you have to go your, south? Your raven, your raven friend has visited me. My raven friend? business. The silver one. <gasps> I. He visited you? She's going to hold out the blood-stained Yggdrasil rune. She also this behind one? for me. Did he, did he speak to you? I more than just speak. I had a vision. All right, I mean, we if must you... must go south. Do I have time to wake my mother and let her know? I. But... Right, uh, do you want to come in while I, while I do this, or do you want to wait outside? That would be most kind. Do uh, you have any uh, any meat? I'm, uh, oh, do we have any meat? Uh, <laughs> I'm famished. You, you come right inside, and I'll get you some meat, I'll get you some ale, and we'll figure out whatever's going on that you see in your vision. But let me, let me tell my mother. And you don't need to cook it, I'll, I'll eat it raw, you know me. I like the juices. I've noticed. She's just oh, gonna, start, gonna, she's just gonna start, start clattering her, uh, her claws and and her big sort of at the thought of raw juicy meat. Tilly will pull back a chair and just pick a big old chunk for her out. Be patarita. It's gonna be a long trek, I'm sure. She'll squawk and start just This this is this is the most um the <sighs> Rowan is normally very composed, but when she's hungry she will just devour. Very much, very much like the like the corbids, which she resembles. <laughs> so she just kind of tears at the meat and pulls strips off of it, and then yeah. kind of enthusiastically snaps them down her gullet with her beak. Yeah. Have you ever seen seen how many birds eat? She's just uh, <laughs> <laughs> just scoping it all down. <laughs> uh, and Tilly will just go and whisper to her mother and tell her that. I think I think her mother would potentially know the relationship she had with Rowan, um, and the importance of that relationship to her. All right, so uh, you share some food, maybe some beer. Uh, probably that accounts for why your mother is so deep in sleep and snoring. You are likely sharing a drink before you left the next day, uh, one of your own brew, I'm certain. I, I doubt she'll even remember. <laughs> and uh, and so we'll move on toward dawn. And as dawn approaches, you take the little snatches of sleep you managed. Uh, Rowan, did you want to tell her about your your premonition in more detail uh, over the yes. course of the night, or are you going to save those? Uh, she'll definitely tell her over the course of the night. And uh, when she's when she tells stories, she tends to, whether knowingly or not, develop her her grandmother's voice. Oh, cool. The one who told her all the stories. And right. so is telling her, telling Tilly about the vision about the silver raven with the scarred eye and the blood that was everywhere and permeating through it, through the floors and the cracks and the woods and on the stone. And how it seemed to stain her own runes. And about the, the very serious warning that we needed to head south until i ask her bloodline um it's it's pretty young and we ever had a vision like this before not not any so strong it's uh now do you know and, where no, we're going no, south? just south not any with so much blood before but When there's blood throughout your whole house, that's when you know that things get serious. I am to say so. Well, I mean, we have a, a great, a great land south. Do you? I mean, 
we can just set out, but I'd have to know a direction of where you want to go. She'll she'll cast the bones. So you uh, you cast the bones. You turn your thoughts toward the Rune Father to give you guidance, and you get sort of uh, just kind of a vague, uh, a vague impression of accompanying south. So perhaps that's all you get for now, and maybe your next step will become clear later. It's all still crowded. <laughs> Well, I mean, what, what we can do is, uh, I, I, we can take our boat, we can travel down the river if you'd like, and then see where we can go from there. Down the river sounds like a good idea. All right. All right. So, no, uh, a, I believe there is a hunt. Are... There is a hunt, and okay. we must be the hunters. Please. You guys make your, your preparations, and as the tide goes out, ready to carry your boats out onto the Nader Strait, you and your sailors and your uh, unexpected passenger are ready. You set out with the tide, sailing just after dawn into the sea. And in the following days, you find yourselves embroiled in the edges of a bloody, bitter war. The Blood Kingdom, as it's now known at this point, has solidified its hold over most of Krakovar. The northern uh, reaches of what was once that kingdom very quickly fall under sway of the Reaver Dwarves. This peninsula is now known as the Wolfmark, and the, the son of the King of Wolfheim sets up a permanent Reaver settlement called Skagerholm which is uh, almost unheard of for them to actually settle anywhere other than where they come from. But as you yourself figured, opportunity like this doesn't come along every day. And so your people are striking while the iron is hot. From there, you set yourselves up in this great fortified timber, uh, s not quite a city, like a large fortified town with a great longhouse at its center on the top of a hill. And it becomes a refugee gathering point. It becomes a, a place of safe haven for the people fleeing from the deprivations of the vampires and the ghouls. And those who can offer something to the dwarves of Skagerholm are allowed to stay. It can be craftsmen, it can be soldiers, it can be people bringing supplies or gold or livestock. And you spend some time there striking out among your, uh, your countrymen, making raids along the north to the other, uh, the other settlements that are taken by the Blood Kingdom. You meet ghouls and vampires and their minions in battle thankfully you've well thankfully or perhaps regretfully depending on how you feel about it you haven't crossed blades with one of the lords of the vampires but you hear fearsome stories that they are the equal of entire platoons of soldiers all on their own and uh, even if the battle turns against them there's almost no way to stop them from escaping it becomes a source of constant frustration for your people trying to strike a telling blow against the vampires mm -hmm. uh for his part now king lucan of the blood kingdom seems content to leave these skirmishes as they are and the greater forces of his uh, his armies aren't pushing farther to the north at least yet and as time goes on, Rowan, you find yourself searching uh, for more information, another sign, something to point you the next way to go. Uh, and all of your castings to this point have been vague until on one of the, one of the close range raids that you've decided to accompany uh, Tilly and her people on to provide uh, divine support, uh, if not to engage in battle yourself, depending on how uh, how warlike you're feeling uh, at any particular time. I leave that up to you to decide. But during the aftermath of one of these battles, Tilly, you and your people, with a flash of insight given to you by your friend Rowan, managed to catch a vampire. Not one of the lords, but a spawn. A lower-ranking vampire of full blood, not a dumpier, not one of the half-breeds, 
even though they can be noble and uh, well-respected and terrible warriors in their own right. You catch yourselves an actual vampire lieutenant. Catch may be the wrong word because you, you, you find him trying to sneak into your encampment and after your men have him pinned down to the ground and are ready to drive a sharpened wooden pike through his chest, he cries out for mercy, begging to be taken to their captain. Okay. Okay, so no? you, you, you call a halt to it and they stop in the very act of beginning to stake this poor bastard. His uh, his eyes are wild, they're rimmed with red, his hair is this dirty blonde, uh, sort of a close crop, and you can see that it's matted with uh, mud and blood and possibly worse. Uh, his skin is very pale and sallow and you can see the faint tracery of blue veins showing underneath it. And he's wearing at his throat an amulet that bears a holy symbol that you recognize during your time here in the Blood Kingdoms and nearby them. It's a holy symbol of Morena, the Red Maiden, the, the maiden of lust and blood whose worship governs the Blood Kingdom and drives many of their rituals and their expansions. And so uh, he is hauled up to his knees, his hands are bound behind his back, and the tip of that wooden pike is set between his shoulder blades and pressed enough to just begin to draw blood. Although you do notice that the wound doesn't seem to bleed. He looks up mm. at you and you can see his fangs prominently visible and he says, you, 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 are, you are the captain. I am the captain and why do you cry for mercy? It's not very honorable to just pray to be saved. Because I do not come to fight you. I come to bring you what I hope is desperate word for our salvation. I wish to tell you of a hope against the Blood King. And why would you tell us that? Do, are you not a Blood King follower yourself? No. No, I I and my ilk, we fought against him. And we, we, we were killed. We are almost, almost all of us destroyed, ground under his heel, left out to the sun, left up on stakes to bleed and die, thrown into pyres. It, uh, Osgrey's folly, they call it. And when he says that word, Rowan, it strikes another shock through you, if you recognize it. Hi. That was the name that was uttered to me by the Silver Raven. This Osprey yeah. fall? It was an uprising organized by one of the noble houses of, of Half Blood, uh, the Dampiers. They, uh, they were um, branded heretics by the, the, the high priestess of the chalice, the, 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 the greatest worshipper and, and priestess of Marena the Red. And he sort of. Uh, glances down to his amulet. But the Oscar, they taught us another way, a way to to worship her, to uh, make blood offering, but not to slaughter all those beneath us, not to wade in the death of the mortals. A better way that would uh, bring prosperity to our, our, our country and our kin. We tried to overthrow the Blood King and we were killed, but I thought all of them were dead in his courtyard, at his palace, but I have heard that one remains. The last scion of the house of Oscre has been seen, and I had to bring the oh. word to someone, anyone, and Morena sent me to you. Names, names. His name is Riodan. Who is the last Riodan, scion? Riodan Oscre, and he was seen in the crossroads. Self? South of here, yes. Uh, when he mentions the crossroads, you know that that region, uh, Tilly, is the area, just kind of the greater area to the south of the Blood Kingdom. Uh, you know that that gets into the Iron Crag Mountains, where uh, some of your distant kin live. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's, you know, the Margrave Forest, which has sort of a, a very dark reputation as to the, the fey folk and the, the ancient magics that live there and the ruins of the once great elvish empires that dominated all of Midgard. Um, he, uh, the, the vampire, 
who tells you his name is Ladislav. Uh, he tells you that the place you need to seek is Zobek in the heart of the crossroads. It was there that I heard that the scion of Oskre lives. His family, they sent out missionaries to carry the word of our faith, the, the true, pure faith of Morena. And it is there where the seed may grow and flourish. So the, uh, the warriors holding him kind of look at each other with disgust and look at you and say, do you want us to dispatch him for you? Um, no, I, I, to be, to be honest, and Rowan, you'll have to forgive me, but, uh, I, I don't trust too easily these, um, ghoulish and, um, vampiric folk. Uh, so what I would like to do with you, sir, is I'm going to take your amulet. You're going to hand it over to me and you'll travel with us down to seek this company of Ryoden, Ryoden, Rowan, if that's okay with you. Ryoden. He, uh, so he sort of uh, draws himself up and he strains against the warriors who are holding him and they just sort of immediately pin him down. You can see that he is tremendously strong, but he's got a reaver on each arm and then another one behind him and he really has no reasonable hope of, of shaking them off. But he says, no, no, you must do what your man has said. You must kill me. You must. Rowan is going to reach a hand out to him, his mm -hmm. clawed hand. All right. And he pull, doesn't, pull he doesn't flinch this. away. He, uh, are you going to pull him up to standing? Yes. Or just kind and of lift his chin? Pull, pull, pull him up to standing and then inspect his face. Turning okay, it. so the, the warriors will kind of begrudgingly let you pull him up and they'll kind of haul him to his feet, but they're still, uh, they basically have him in these sort of behind the back arm locks. Uh, that are preventing him from really getting anywhere. Uh, as you sort of hold your claws under his chin and you, you lean forward, you can smell his breath is just foul. It has this stink of uh, faint rot, and you can see that there's this now blackened old blood between his teeth. And he's what sort of looking at you, you, and he says, this, there is to be, there should be no debate, you must kill me. The one who made me is not dead. If she calls to me, I must go. What she bids me, I must do. My my church, uh, those of my, my true faith, they are dead. They are dead because of me, because she she found out. She learned of our, of our, our, our uh, she learned of our shrine and she forced me to tell her of the truth. And now they are all dead. She not will- your, your faith is so set in stone in the way that you say. And she's going and you to don't understand how we are. She's going to cast the bones just to get some idea of just how likely this is. To you happen. cast the bones, and they give you back one sort of startlingly clear word: death. What did the bones read? Just g gives Tilly a look, which just says, "This ain't good." <laughs> I, I have something that might. Can you be discharged? Can you be oh, less no. dangerous? There's I would prefer to not leave somebody like this behind, just to temper, just in case he's playing no. a trick on us. I don't know. No, you, 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 do, you do not understand. She, her, my blood is her blood. If she calls to me, I must go. I can oh, feel no. her even now. Oh no, I, I know that full well. I'm no fool, vampire. She's going to. Oh, that's a that's a good cat. She's going. <laughs> she's going to look look at at the vanguard and just and give them an order. Defang him. Uh, Strike out okay. his fangs. So they will look at you. Know. Mm, I think it's a little bit cruel, don't you think? I mean, I'd, I'd rather... I'd rather give him an honorable death than torture him. That's not really of... That's not really so of... 
or, or after. As the Reavers... As the Reavers kind of look between you two, there's a moment of distraction, and he seizes it. Ladislav throws one of his arms free, grabs the the back of the nape of the neck, and just buries his claws and fist into the hair, and drives his fangs into the throat of one of the Reavers. You can hear the flesh tear, and you can see the hot blood spurt into the air, and uh, steam rises from it in the cold in the cold night. And the one behind him screams a curse and drives the pike through his through his back. You can hear the crunch of his spine, his heart, and then his sternum pop as the pike drives through the front and the the vampire lets out this strangled gasp and then just sort of hangs limp, his eyes wide and fixed and staring. Till he runs this forward. My dear, this, my dear, is why we take them. We don't let them have uh, their weapon. So... Are either of you proficient in insight? Um, let me check. Uh, I am. You are? So you get the feeling that while he was trying to kill that fellow next to him, there was a hopeless, desperate sort of feel to him. He knew he had no hope of succeeding. He was trying to force your men's hand. Rowan, in, in a time of battle, I do, I've do. i seen a few of these vampires be very powerful, and I think could easily have taken over a little bit of charge here or there, but um, the, the look in his eye was not one of battle, it was one more of um, desperation. Uh, I... I think I... I'm not sure why. I mean, I, under I understand his fear of his own uh, maiden, but I don't... I've never seen this out of this people before. I think we should take the amulet and go. Take the amulet, but I need... I need the fangs. Ooh. Uh, the uh, the dwarf whose throat has been torn is holding a, a hand to his neck and you can see his blood spilling between the fingers of his gauntlet and he's just cursing up a blue streak and uh, and after you say that he says you want fangs I'll get you fangs don't worry about that he draws oh. his knife flips it backwards and oh. just starts bashing the top jaw of the vampire with the pommel of the knife and you can hear bones start to crack stop your complaining and she'll, she'll um, do a cure burns on him. Okay, that'll be enough to, to stop his bleeding and mend uh, most of the issues. Uh, it looks like um, the vampire probably in drinking some of his blood also drained some of his life essence, and that's beyond your means to heal at this point. But you know that you at least stopped the bleeding since his you know, neck was lacerated. He won't bleed out, and then he'll recover over time. Uh, so he bashes into the, the, the vampire's skull a few times, and you can see pain registering in the immobile creature's eyes, and they just sort of look wild, although it seems that he is completely unable to move or even to scream or cry out. And uh, so the Reaver Dwarf reaches down, pulls up uh, a bloody heap of teeth and bone fragments, and starts sifting through them with one finger. And after a few moments, he hands you, he holds out his hand to you, just stained with blood, and you can see two long, needle-sharp canines stained with blood and bits of gum in his palm. She'll just snatch them. Just he, uh, he nods at you, kind of touches his neck again and says, Thank you, I won't forget it. They won't be troubling you no more. Now these... She'll just hold them up very in the tip of her nails. They might be able to help us find this scion. Interesting. I don't understand your magic, magic ways, but whatever you say, Rowan. Oh no, I, I don't understand them half the time either. But there are tales that my grandmother taught me. And who am I to question the old crone. And Tilly will call their um, guards over to help up some when 
and be like, let's get on the road. All right. So you're going to make whatever necessary orders for your men to, to continue doing everything that they need to be doing, and you're going to set out. So you, you consult your maps and charts, and you're, you're quite proficient and adept at navigation. So you're very easily able to chart out that the best way for you to go is going to be to take to the river. You know that uh, not only is that going to be the fastest way for you to get to Zobek, the, the city in the center of the crossroads, but it's also going to protect you from vampires because they don't seem to be comfortable on the water. Um, anytime vampires are on ships, it's very rare, and uh, they don't seem to be interested in any sort of shipboard engagements. They flee from it at the first opportunity. All right. Um, and I, I'll say even that you have, uh, the, in the course of the time that you've been fighting here in Krakovar, you've come to realize that uh, running water, such as in a river, uh, is death to a vampire. All right, it's our, our best means of travel. Uh, Rowan, I'm, I'm kind of following you blindly on this, but um, I guess we'll find this Uri, Uriodan, Uriodan, Uriodan. <laughs> well, now we know where to go south, to Zobek. Zobek, all right. All right, so do you leave any further orders uh, to deal with Ladislav, or do you just let the soldiers take care of it? I mean, I think, I think we should burn him. He was, he was beyond recovery, as far as I can see. Do you see anything else you need at his bones, or, or eyeballs, or skin, or anything, Rowan? I think I have all I need. All right, and she'll order her guards to burn him. All right, the so they set death. about, they immediately take their uh, battle axes and immediately set to gathering wood. Are you going to stick around for that? Because it's going to take them a while to build a pyre and all that business, or do you just want to leave them to it and then go? I trust him enough, I think, especially after they've seen what he's done to somebody or another guard. Excellent. All right, so uh, I'm going to pause here, and we're going to turn this over to our lovely, lovely viewers for a viewer decision. <laughs> Who is going to show oh, back up, viewers? Ladislav or Corin the Reaver? Corin being the one who bashed Ladislav's fangs out. Repeat the question one, one more time for me, Dan. Who, who are we going to see again? Ladislav the Vampire Spawn or Corin the Reaver? Ooh. Ooh, that's nice. a good one. I like them both. <laughs> Can I spell Corazon? Uh, I... Sorry? Sorry? Can I spell Corazon? Corin, K O R R A N. A N, beautiful. Interesting. I think his what name should be Vlad the, Impa Vlad the Impaled, is his new nickname. Vlad the Impaled, yeah. <laughs> my, my friend, uh, he had a he had an Impala, and his, and his, uh, his Impala was called Vlad the Impala. Um, <laughs> Oh, I like them both. Uh, for any of our for any of our viewers who aren't familiar with how this works, you're gonna set up uh, you see you set up a poll and then you go click on it there. Put a right? poll there no. in the chat. See, yeah, you can just uh, you just click there and uh, vote the one okay. you want to and the most popular so one. Happens. I'll, I'll keep uh, you appraised. Uh, yep, we will get to that later. That will come into play later on. Um, oh, and just in case we have any new viewers who aren't familiar with how some of the interaction works on Encounter Roleplay, you guys can, of course, donate and spend bits to, to do awesome stuff like wild magic surges and healing surges and mounts and magic items and all kinds of cool things. Sometimes um, I'm not just going to drop those out of a clear blue sky on the players in the game. I like to work them in so they make a little more sense. Uh, so if you donate for something, please trust me that I will make a note of it and it will happen at least in some way. Um, I may not take exactly what you write, but I will use that as the the soul of whatever the the effect is going to be, and it will happen. It might be at a later later in the session. It might be at a later session. But please believe, if you donate, it will happen. Because uh, we've had a few donations, and some of those might be a little difficult for me to seamlessly work in tonight. But it will uh, it will be a thing for the future for sure. Uh, all right. So uh, you head your way south with some supplies and uh, you take a um, uh, 
basically you take a small keel boat so the two of you can crew it uh, easily enough it has oars if you want to row it also has a small triangular sail that you can use to catch the wind and uh, and since you're going to be moving mostly against the current of this particular river that will help you so you don't have to row the entire way that would uh, that would suck uh, but you make your way south <laughs> you make your way south toward the uh, toward the city of Zob, the free city so why don't we Flashback to our uh, to our Zobekian heroes. <laughs> Nobody from Zobek calls it that, by the way. That's only what I. <laughs> People from Zobek say Zobeker. Uh, so Glaz, you talking? are you are inducted into the Collegium and you are accepted as an apprentice. Uh, have great knowledge and aptitude with leyline magic, which the Collegium is currently lacking, and so there is great interest in the limits of your magical power and what you're able to bring to bear. Um, over the course of the few months that this is happening, one thing that you notice, uh, since in your studies you will occasionally cast detect magic, you'll, you'll examine various, uh, various relics and artifacts that might be part of your studies, or uh, even sometimes somebody will come to you at the Hedgehog Tavern and pay you for your services. So one thing that you notice is the lantern that you guys that, that you're carrying most of now most of the time do you keep the lantern on you or uh do you leave it at home i think he probably keeps it on him i think it's um i it, you know, i didn't say specifically him researching it but i think it sort of fascinates him that this is something that traveled from another plane and just with the idea of i mean and this is kind of me as well. I kind of almost think that Glass almost thinks of it as kind of like almost like a lay node. You know, it's like this little, okay. you know, mm. I think he, you know, how he's processing it in his brain is that this is almost like a piece of this, what he feels with the ley lines, but it's like an actual, instead of it being a part of the earth and a part of the environment, that it's this. You know, it's almost like he's captured a little piece of a ley line, and I think that uh, you know is would be something he could probably keep close by. Okay, uh, so one time when you're examining some bobble or another for uh, one of your colleagues, or at least someone who heard of you and and offered you a few coins for your your magic and your trouble, you realize that the lantern is radiating magic, and more than just the elemental no moat was radiating before. That's still there, of course, but the lantern housing itself is magical. Well, this is interesting. Huh. Uh, what type of magic? Uh, of what magic. type of magic indeed? Uh, I would call it... There's a little bit of a mixture of evocation and divination. Ooh, that's a nice mix. Well, what have you... He sort of looks at it and probably holds it up in front of his face. Now, what have you become, my dear? That is quite a... quite an interesting mix you've got going on. Um, and so you can, you can very easily uh, cast identify or identify, spend some time yeah. with it, however you'd like to do. All right. So you pull out your uh, your moose hide with your your lay tracks and maps of Midgard with your encoded spells all over it, and you spend your time in ritual, and you come to realize that the lantern is has become a lantern of revealing. So this I lantern, I love those. <laughs> This lantern ever burns because of the heart of flame within it. You don't need to fuel it with oil as you would normally need to do. Instead, what you have to do is use an action to activate its revealing property, and then it functions as normal. It lasts for an hour, um, and uh, and uh, you can you know change the light. So it gives off magical light, uh, and anything within the bright light shed by the lantern while it is active cannot uh, re is revealed if it is invisible. So you can see invisible creatures and objects within the bright light of the active lantern. Awesome. Love um, those so much. 
And we're going to say that it, uh, since it doesn't require oil or anything like that, you could theoretically just have it running all the damn time, and that's not going to happen. So you can uh, use that property once, and then you can't use it again until the following dawn. So a slight modification okay. on the, uh, the Lantern of Revealing. Uh, however, it has another property that might make up for that a little bit. Okay. One moment. Let me make sure I don't uh, misspeak here. Uh, one moment, one moment. When uh, you bring the lantern itself close to and in contact with a magic item, the magic item glows. So it can essentially mm. be used to detect magic by touch. Oh, that's that's cool. So uh, same once per once per dawn. Uh, that one is not once per dawn, but it does require an action, and it's like single use. You touch it to a thing, activate it, and if the thing you're touching is magical, it will glow. Gotcha. Cool. Yep. All right. Uh, so. You spend your time uh, scribing your new spells that you have decoded from the journal of Werner Strauss. Uh, so you can spend your gold and uh, do whichever ones you had the, the resources for there. Uh, you also puzzle something new out of the journal. You puzzle out a magic item formula. This is for an item called a Twilight Mantle. It creates a magical cloak that shrouds the wearer and protects them from direct sunlight if they have an aversion to it. Uh, you seem to be muted yeah. if you're saying something. I was typing away. So this yeah. would be would have been like useful for Kari from the shadow. Certainly yeah. have been useful for Kari. Yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, because that was just because direct sunlight, right? Yeah, you, it, it will protect anyone who has something like sunlight sensitivity or uh, uh, some other trait that uh, is that right. causes sunlight to be a bane to them. Gotcha. Uh, and you wanted to see about having your dagger enchanted, right? I did. So, uh, who, l l let me think here. You were wanting, um, you, did you want it to have a bonus to hit and damage and all that? You want it to be a magic weapon? Is that, yeah, is that what you're looking would, for? That was dagger. that okay. you, mean, you can get it to a plus one or because it's a flame dragon tooth or if there was something more fun and exciting. And that doesn't, you know, if, that it, you know. Plus one is great, but I'd always you always because such of, great flavor. <laughs> sure. Uh, because of the great esteem that you folks have been gathering, and you in particular bringing artifacts like uh, the Heart of Flame for the Collegium to study, uh, the, the knowledge that you have brought with what was happening with the ley line, uh, all of that, they're actually willing to do something they normally would not, and... Uh, see to the enchantment of your flame dragon fang dagger. Uh, and so it will indeed be enchanted over the course of those few months. It will have a plus one bonus to hit and to damage, but it will also... Uh, what was the uh, the dragon fang dagger's effect? It did extra damage to it cult did of extra the dragon. damage on folks from the, um, from the dragon queen, from the uh, uh, dragon much, cult. How uh, much damage was it? Or... Stand by one second. I had it pulled up. Uh, I've got it here in the manage equipment. Uh, uh, Dragon tooth dagger, and uh, on that um, dagger's bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls. Uh, it increases to plus two against cult of the dragons and acid damage to two d six. Oh, that it does on a hit with this weapon. The target takes an extra one d six damage. So it was it's a plus one then okay. some. Damage. Does it require uh, attunement? Uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine it doesn't. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Well, we'll worry about that in a minute. Okay. So, so yeah. this dagger, the flame dragon, we'll call it the flame dragon's fang. Uh, it is. It has a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls, and will deal an additional one d six fire damage, which increases to two d six against um, draconic creatures. Or anyone from, uh, like, in service to the Lords of the Dragon Empire. Ooh, that's convenient in the Midgard campaign. <laughs> a little bit. We got a dragon cult. Don't worry about that. 
That's right. All right. So while that's going on, Cloak, you said that you were looking to train Puff Puff to make sure that she was a little more reliable, able to stay safe in combat in intense situations. Is that is is that correct? Uh, yeah. So he, he was training her to you know uh, to be uh, tougher and and all that kind of stuff. Um, I would also like to add that whole lamp scenario in my head. This is how it went down. Glass started talking to his lamp, then moved all the food off the table where Cloak was eating, laid out the moose thing, and started doing his ritual, and he's like, I'm pooping. And then he just walks out the door. Uh, Fair enough. um, So, uh, yeah, he would go to uh, Paula's. um, That's where he would stop by in the morning to go talk to her uh, on his kind of, like, daily routine. Okay. Sure. Uh, what were you, you were looking for, uh, some, 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 something to do with your saber, I believe that, uh, yeah. with Paula. Yes. Enchanting okay. So saber or... speaking, speaking to Paula about enchanting your saber, um, you're just basically looking for, for a magic weapon, right? Is you're not, do you have any particular yeah. enchantment in mind you were looking for? You're just looking for a way to get magic on that blade, right? Yeah. Something to give a little bit more damage. Okay. Uh, Whether, so, like, I think I think with his study of fire so much, something maybe like a fire additional fire property or something okay. along those lines. But um, since it's like study into the planar realms and uh, mainly the fire realm because that's the most one he had interaction with so far. Okay. Um, so she will uh, look into that. She will be. Uh, a little reluctant at first or not, not reluctant. I'm sorry. Um, she will not be optimistic, uh, when you first bring the, uh, the request to her. However, after some time studying and talking to you over what she's looking for, she says in her just sort of resonant, uh, dwarvish tones, she says, "Ah, I think there might be something I can do. Uh, and you can tell that there's a butt coming because of just the dark cast on her features but I think it's also going to require the Heart of Flame, and I think we'll have to return to my family's seat to make it happen. What you're asking is no small feat. I mean, are you up to it? I I think, I think so, yes. But I can't do that on my own. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not a wizard, I suppose what it boils down to. I mean, I'm sure Glass would love to go back there. I'm, I'm sure it's all cleared out, too. Still. Well, we can hope. Of course, we'll have to travel through the Margrave again, and she does not look excited about that prospect. Do we have to? If you know any other way to get to the, the halls of Everforge, I'm all ears. Which, as you recall, is about a day's travel into the Margrave. Yeah. Um, do we have to bring, bring an offering, if I remember, to the Margrave? Uh, well, it, it can certainly help. Um, as you recall, or you've you've spent some time studying. We'll we'll call this part of your part of your library studies during the downtime. Uh, bringing an mm-hmm. offering to the Margrave most certainly helps. Uh, every everything you can read, everything you can learn, every story you can pick up about the Margrave is people talk about it as if it's alive somehow. In, in some strange way. Um, and mm. if the Margrave doesn't like you, you are well advised to stay the hell away from there. Um, you think, based on the relative ease of your journey through the Margrave uh, when you were leaving the Halls of Everforge, for instance, you think the Margrave, mm. for some reason, is, is relatively well disposed towards you. You're not exactly okay. sure why. That makes me nervous. Um, so, uh, um, I, uh, I'd be like, yeah, I think a glass, um, I can see if I can sober up Riordan, but I wouldn't count on it. But I'm sure so really glass would love to call. Sure. So that's going to be a bit of an undertaking. That's not really something we can get done during the downtime. So when you guys mm-hmm. want to plan an expedition into the Margrave to, to take your blade and the Heart of Flame back to the, the Halls of Everforge, Paula thinks she can she can make something happen there. Okay. All right. 
So uh, let's talk about the the training you're doing with Puff Puff. So is that just uh, is there any mm -hmm. particular um, goal you have in mind there, like any particular mechanical benefit you're looking for, or just this is what you're up to and whatever it does, it does. I, it, it's more like leveling her up. Um, sure. Because I I because I don't know because uh, it's not really like an animal companion. It's a you know. Yeah. Um, it's a. It is. She's an NPC ally, is what she is. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So it would. You... No, go ahead. No, go ahead. All right. Uh, so I will say, over the course of the time, as you're training her, if you guys, rem if you remember, you're even more sure of it now. Do you speak uh, Sylvan? You do speak Sylvan, don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She I understands do. Sylvan fluently. She gets the gist of common, but when you speak to her in Sylvan, it's like you're conversing with another person. She can't talk back. She seems to lack whatever whatever facility you would need to, to form speech, but she understands you perfectly. Once you realize that, you sort of conduct your training in, um, in Sylvan with her, and it's like training a person. So mm -hmm. I think I might do something silly and let Puff Puff the Blink Dog take a level of Ranger. Ranger Puppy. Da, 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 <laughs> Ranger Puppy. If that sounds um, uh, like a reasonable sort of thing you're talking about. This is the uh, best timeline. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, uh, I would also train her by uh, Kane's grave, uh, just to kind of because uh, he he was my ranger buddy, uh, and also mm -hmm. he was an asshole. Um, so, uh, but kind of like and like as like you know done training, like kind of give him uh, an update of what's going on, like talking to his grave. And I was like, I know you're not okay. there because you're a dick. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the devils have his ass. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. Kane was great. Uh, all right, uh, so that that is one thing that we will handle. All right, so you are also doing a uh, study on the Shadow Realm, uh, sorry, the Shadow Roads, um, planar research in general, as well as the Dragon. Um, mm -hmm. I think you guys had managed to find some information on the Dragon that it was uh -oh. involved with some certain merchants, if you recall. Yeah. Uh, I... no, wait, hold on. No, we I have a note. Uh, Hold on. Yeah. Uh, Ig Igbalnim, the merchant? Ig Igbalnim Ig was the dragon. Oh, Ig yeah, okay. Well, I the dragon. in my study, because how I took the note down is that I thought it was the merchant, because we didn't know at that time, so now it's official. Okay. Right. So you, you learned that uh, there was a dragonborn merchant name of Savaran Delmarev. Uh, oh, I yeah, that's, okay. That's the merchant. Right. right. So uh, there really isn't much more to discover about this dragon, uh, at least not in Zobek's libraries. Uh, it was obscure at best, and it was kind of a stroke of luck that they had this little bit even anyway. Uh, so you have about the mm -hmm. best link you can do to that. Um, since you've been studying with Glaz, and probably you've been doing most of the studying of his notes on the, the various ley lines, but there is material in the library on it as well. So you, mm -hmm. uh, you have a reasonable understanding of the functioning of ley lines and the way shadow roads work in particular. Uh, and so that will come into play if you have you know questions about lore on how to uh, activate or access a particular shadow road, because you know they're not just always open. You need some way to open the way to the road. Uh, and that is never uh, never something done lightly. There's usually some manner of sacrifice and ritual involved, and it's not a guarantee. There's a, there's a degree of danger in, in undertaking these rituals. But you also learn about a particular relic or artifact, not, not capital A artifact, but uh, a, a magical item from times long gone by called a Key of Velus. And it is said that the possessor of a Key of Velus has full access to any Shadow Road they come across and can even change its destination temporarily. Mm. They're pretty awesome. I've heard about them myself. <laughs> Pretty good. I wonder, I wonder if that's good. a cult leader. A cult leader. Uh, the, the guy who had like rotten teeth and said void shit all the time. Um, maybe he had one of those. 
I'm not sure if it is that. Well, perhaps uh, it was a, a it would be a really big key of Alice, but uh, I think more likely it was the uh, the gentleman in the white robe. So he was able to just uh, zip in away from us there, way back when we first found the uh, Book of Ernest mm. Stross. Is, so that, that didn't be... seem to be use of a, that didn't seem to be use of a shadow road. It looked like he was okay. using magic, such as dimension door. He was that was oh. actually a, a short range teleport. Gotcha. And for those Never of our, our for, to refresh for our viewers and uh, and anybody else, long range teleportation magic does not exist in Midgard. There is no teleport. There is no teleportation circle. The uh, the long range uh, fast magical travel uh, is affected by means of accessing the shadow roads. Uh, so uh, I think that more or less covers cloak. Yes. So let's get on to Riodan and his self destructive indulgence. Um, are you spending most of your time drinking and whoring at the Silk Scabbard or other places? Sure. Wherever. Sure. <laughs> Whatever, wherever. Fuck okay, so, so it looks like as Fuck much as he avoids you guys, you can still, he's still kind of a creature of habit, of sticky, sometimes very gross habit, and you can catch him at the Silk Scabbard. Uh, now and again, if you're ever trying to find him. Although it looks like he is uh, avoiding you pretty righteously. Anytime you show up, he suddenly has business elsewhere. Uh, and I would say that over the course of the two or three months that happens, you have not seen him sober one time in all of the times that you've okay. managed to run it. Yeah, I, I, I don't assume think that I've ever keep seen him sober. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> It's a bad baseline. I assume that Laz <laughs> keeps up his games with uh, with Valia, so oh, yeah. you know, yep. uh, I might glance him out of the corner, and I'm sure if he sees me, he disappears back into whatever, back into because he well, he's got the whole like private area, or or is he still? Are you still? Is how that turn out? Does he get? Can he still go access the shrine to Milena? I mean, he can yeah, okay. he doesn't. I don't think. <laughs> like I think yeah, if he uses that. If he uses that back door in the silk scabbard, it's just to get into the cartways, and he avoids the shrine entirely. He's, he's become a real user, right, to the point where he will use that connection in order to get access to the to the bar, even right. if he should be barred from it, you know? So, yeah, gotcha. that, that I was going to say that his connection to the shrine and his connection to the silk scabbard and to Tyron, the fellow who owns and runs it, um, that is basically what has kept him from being blacklisted out of there. And he can still occasionally manage some companionship, although the the companions at the, the silk scabbard have started to avoid him as well because they can see that his life is in a tailspin. And believe it or not, most of them care. And uh, they don't want to contribute to that. Uh, and so anytime you're playing with Valia and, and uh, Riodan comes through, there's this sort of pall that, that falls over the bar. And she gives you this sort of heartfelt look of sympathy. She never really says anything. Uh, if it seems like you don't want to talk about it, if you do, she will listen gladly. But uh, she doesn't push. Uh um. I've got just a curiosity question because Will, you were talking about how you basically Wait, just uh, did you sell your armor? It's the last. It's the next thing to go. Yeah, the next thing to go is the armor. Um, okay, so he hasn't that yet. He doesn't wear it whip? anymore. Um, I was oh, say, the whip. So the whip is gone. The yeah, the scour you sold the scourge for sure. Ooh. It's gone. Like it, he pawned it oh, off. The, the dagger. The, the the blade the ritual the ritual knife dag is gone the heart's blood Chris the and heart's blood Chris and the sanguine scourge are gone let me make a note of that I give away oh, man. all of my items from season one except from uh, except from the uh, the armor which is the next thing to go it's probably because you couldn't find a buyer for it so far or someone to pawn <laughs> off to uh, well, he is, knows who he sold these items to like he, you know he's sure he knows who he sold them to but um he I doesn't care for them anymore for future viewer decisions. Yeah, doesn't need right. him anymore. Uh, got it. Fair enough. All right. So your your life for a few months is a haze. It's a haze of hangovers and your mouth that tastes like a cat crawled in there and died, and whirlwinds of forced laughter and booze-soaked spinning bar rooms and 
grapples on lumpy pallets with you don't even remember their faces anymore. Just uh, a one blur after another of uh, of of any number of companions uh, as you as you see fit at the time. I would imagine. Yeah. At one point, you've uh, you've exhausted your supply of this uh, uh, this interesting herbal confection that you discovered that House Zealus was responsible for, if you recall. Uh, I believe it's called... Where is it? A Cori Blossom. Oh, yeah. Yep, a, the A Cori Blossom. It's a, it's a hallucinogen. Um, it probably has some use in making of magic, but you don't really care anymore. Uh, so you've exhausted that supply, and <clears throat> getting more has become damnably difficult for some reason. So, uh, at one point, you find yourself turning toward that little wax paper packet of Requiem. And I believe you said you were going to do it. So, still still on board for that? Oh, yeah. All right. So, you tamp it down into a little pipe. You ignite it with, uh, with a, a sputtering old candle in your room, wherever you are. Are you going to be in the scabbard in your room at this point or some other dive? It's wherever I am. You, tell you me. know? Yeah, where am I? Uh, it's in the room. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the scabbard? scabbard. Mm. Okay. So immediately uh, the hallucinogens be a, the, you take a, a lung full of this acrid sort of thick smoke, and it looks sort of like cigarette smoke. It's wispy, it's kind of filmy, it's white. But as it burns, you would swear that you could see as the, the smoke curls up and dances and eddies in the air, you can almost see faces looking at you in, uh, in this, this strange smoke. Uh, and the smell is almost incense-like, and it kind of fills your room very quickly. And as you take lungfuls of it, it doesn't burn. It feels heavy in your chest. It begins to make it feel like your lungs are made of lead. And you find yourself breathing slower and a little bit heavier without even realizing it. And uh, as you you let the, the effects of this stuff wash over you, the, the room starts to breathe a little. The walls begin to pulse, almost like the shadows are sliding across it, moving of their own accord. Uh, textures in the bedspread and in the wood seem to crawl, but they never really go anywhere. It's like one of those uh, optical illusion gifts that look like everything is spinning, but nothing's moving. Uh, it's, it's very disorienting. And then you start to hear the whispers. So in this moment... Who or what are you thinking about or trying to contact? Maybe even not consciously trying to contact. Because okay. if you guys remember, when smoking Requiem, it allows you to call up the soul of a deceased person known to you. It's absolutely Cain. Okay. You begin thinking about Cain. You turn your now sort of fuzzy, clouded, smoke-shrouded thoughts to him, and uh, your breathing becomes slower and deeper as you, uh, as you breathe in the last of this, this burning stuff in your pipe. The feeling of Cain, your friend, your family member, distant though he was, uh, sort of settles over you like, uh, like a cloak made of iron, and you try your best to call up every detail of him that you can. And damn it, but you, you realize that you're having trouble sort of reconstructing his face. It's only been a few months. How could those details have slipped your mind already? What, what color were his eyes exactly? Did he have crow's feet? What about his hair? Had he gone to salt and pepper yet at the, at the temples? Dampier sometimes never do. And as you reach out, there is this just terrible feeling of emptiness. As you reach out for Cain's soul through this Requiem, there's just nothing there. Nothing comes. There's no apparition, no feeling of contact like you were supposed to have. Nothing. Nothing. 
how does Riodan react to that? Well, fine. I, uh... I think he, like, just collapses. You know, just, just kind let, of... Let's unconsciousness take him. You know, he is nothing... There's, there's no sort of mental wherewithal to even, like, have the lights on anymore. He, do, he doesn't have the, the ability to, to, you know, to even make it to a bed. Okay. He's just... Uh, so you don't really... You don't think about anyone or anything else. You just sort of... Uh, you just sort of crawl back into bed and kind of collapse into it. Right? The, the feelings of euphoria... Sorry, what? It's easier for him not to think now. Okay, so there's this feeling of euphoria that's supposed to come along with Requiem Bliss, but it doesn't really seem to be working, and you're you're getting angrier and, and more sour about it because it's just this heavy feeling settling over you, not this not this bliss that the damn stuff is named for. And uh, you're starting to wonder if that bastard you killed in the dragon's chamber didn't have it cut with something else entirely. But uh, as you sort of drift off insensate... Uh, on your bed, letting this the last of the smoke fill the room. Uh, I would like you to... What's a question that's on your mind? What is something you want to know? I think Reardon questions what he has left to live for. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, All right. So you're 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 thinking that that you know what is what what does it all mean anymore? What what do I even bother doing with myself? Is it worth it? Should I even try? And you are settling down, and you can almost feel your body melting into the soft, comfortable covers of your bed, and your eyes drift closed, and then you hear a chattering voice at your ear, and it sounds like maybe an animal but you discern some kind of strange meaning in it. And it's asking you almost in a dozen languages at once, who are you? Your eyes snap open and you're laying, not in your room, you're outside. The air isn't thick and heavy and stagnant with the Requiem Bliss smoke filling what used to be your chamber. It's cool clear, crisp night air. You can see a thick blanket of stars through a small opening in what is otherwise dense, impenetrable canopy, leaves. And you realize that your shoulder is uncomfortable and you're laying on something hard, irregular, digging into the small of your back. You, you look down, and you're resting on a massive tree branch in sort of the Y where it branches out, just, just away from the trunk. You see the trunk, and you look, and it's like someone changing the depth of field on a video camera. The branch just sort of gets longer and farther, and you can see a massive tree trunk with whorled gray and brown bark stretching out in front of you and you you let your eyes drift around and you can see more of these branches that likewise seem to be stretching off into the distance like space no longer has any concrete meaning for you and you can just see them reaching off toward the stars you look down and it's just branches and tree trunk all the way down that you can see you look up same You look over to your right, where you heard the chittering, and there is a curious little creature sitting there staring at you. It's canted its head to the side. It has sort of reddish-brown fur, and it looks, at first glance, like a squirrel. A little bigger than a standard squirrel you might expect to see. Uh, and it has tusks, these great yellowish ivory teeth that kind of poke down from beyond its lips. And you also notice it's wearing an iron and silver torque around its neck with whirls and knotwork and uh, these strange stylized, almost Celtic looking uh, tree branch images carved, etched into it. 
What the fuck are you? This is what you see. It tilts its head the other way, and it chatters, and you hear very, very clearly to your ears, I know what the fuck I am. What the fuck are you? I don't know. Am I dead? Is it? Mm, Not yet. Not Mm. quite. A little. You did something... Hmm. No, no, I think you're still alive. For the moment, that makes you useful, maybe. Useful. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. How? It sort of uh, draws itself up a little bit, and its little squirrely shoulders hunch forward, and you can see that around its wrists are gold and silver bracelets with runes stamped on them, and there's a little earring dangling from its big tufted ear, and it hops forward, and there's a great intricate sort of smooth braid run down the the center of its bushy tail that ends in a little silver ring with an emerald uh, jingling uh, shining on the end of it. It hops across the branch and uh, sort of hops up onto your lap and it leans forward and its nose twitching, sniffing, comes right up to your face and it says, don't you smell it? Don't you smell the smoke and the flames coming? here for us now? No, I lost a lot. You take a deep breath, and then immediately you begin coughing and hacking as you draw in a lungful of thick, sooty smoke. And it has this taste that just sort of crawls across your tongue and then dies. That's nothing you've ever smelled before. Or is it? It immediately makes you shudder and think of that thing that was destroying Glass's house. You catch a whiff of that in the smoke, and you look, and you see down below you this ruddy glow beginning to stretch up the endless branches and trunk of this tree, and you, there are these thick, greasy columns of smoke and swirling ash rising up from it. Where am I? Am I hallucinating? Yes. Yes, very much so. Good. But okay, can't that good. be true? Dunno. Really? Maybe it'll just my memories or consciousness or something. I don't I don't know. I don't wanna be here. I'm tired. Maybe. Maybe I'm not real. But maybe he looks down maybe I'm mad. at that nasty oh, pall of smoke rising up and swirling around you, and you can feel it kind of sinking into your clothes, and this greasy feeling from the ash that's carried on it is starting to slick your skin, and you're even starting to feel that over the day's worth of unwashed sweat and worse that's probably caking your body at this point. And as you, you kind of look down, you can see those flames licking higher and higher as the world tree that you're sitting in seems to stretch before you warping space around it. The flames are running up it just as fast, almost like negating its attempt to stretch onto infinity. And the, the, uh, the thing gets in your face again and says, I am Ratatusk. You might not think I'm real, but the world tree is burning all the same, and you are going to burn in its branches, Riodan. All of us are going to burn in its branches. That's fine by me, little squirrel. Do you think I care? Hmm. I know. Hmm. No, now you don't care. Someday you might. Hopefully soon. The one-eyed ravens are coming to tell you the truth. Sure. Whatever you say. Don't I'm ignore them or everything. Sure. Right. Right. I'm pretty yeah. sure I'm insane. And that I'm probably drunk. So Maybe as you far are. as I'm concerned, figment of my imagination that the whole world can burn. Watch me watch it. We can watch the it together over there. 
No, not the whole world. All worlds. Every branch and every leaf falling, tumbling, screaming into void. Sounds just like he wanted. Who wanted? It grins, this almost Cheshire to human grin, and lunges forward and bites you, and you flail and shriek and stumble away from it and uh, find yourself, whoomp, landing with a, a, now a bruised cheekbone on the floor of your room. And it looks like the candle on your uh, side table there has been knocked over, caught something on fire, and burnt a little bit and filled your room with smoke. Uh, so you wake up coughing and spluttering and now with a headache starting up and uh, a big nasty bruise on your cheekbone. Fucking dreams. I, 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 I get up and I call out of the room. Waiter! Waiter, there's a fire in my room again! <laughs> All right. And I think with that... We're going to leave it off for this week and pick up next time, meeting our uh, our new arrivals to Zobek and seeing just how much of Riodan's fever and drug-induced dreams were truth and how much were just him trying to drink himself into an early grave. <laughs> Woo! All righty. That was an episode, my friends. I am... I am excited for this season after that, let me tell you. Holy moly. Um, well, if uh, if you guys enjoyed tonight's show, definitely let us know later in the chat. If you haven't yet followed the show, hit the follow button and join us. You can uh, like and prescribe if you're on YouTube as well. Uh, but holy shit, uh, if you haven't checked out the World of Kobold Trees uh, Midgard campaign setting, go ahead and check it out. They're on koboldpress.com. This one's for the show, of course, and we're having a fantastic time exploring more of the, uh, the mythos around... Uh, so yeah, definitely check that shit out. But let's go around to cast and the crew. Did we enjoy ourselves? And of course, where can we find each other online, Dan? Fantastic job tonight. How was that? Thank you very much. Oh, I had a blast. Uh, I love diving back into this. Like I said, I've been I've been jonesing to get back into Midgard. I'm so excited for our new faces joining us. You both did great with your preludes. Um, a little bit of you know. A little bit of uh, work getting everybody caught up and stitched back together. Trust me, next week we will be diving right into getting you uh, brought into the current action. And uh, I am so looking forward to that. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dan underscore Dylan underscore one. I love to talk D&D, &D, so hit me up there anytime. Uh, I am also on Facebook. I'm one of the moderators on the 5th edition, uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition Facebook group. It's the giant one with over 130,000 members. Uh, we have new people joining all the time. Come and, come and check us out there. We love to talk D&D, &D, and I hope to see you guys around before next week. Thanks so much, Dan. And uh, Tool School, how's up? Well, you saw me having my mind blown about, I don't know, about every 15 minutes because of all the coolness that Dan is weaving into this. So, uh, no, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store. This is amazing. I cannot wait. Uh, I am so excited. I love, I love, 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 love Tilly and Rowan. I love how their stories are connected. I love that Rowan and Tilly are going to have to meet the person they've traveled. You battled their way through the blood love. kingdom to uh, arrive at Rio Dan's door, which is just <laughs> I, that scene. I cannot wait. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I'm, I'm tall squall. I am, I am overwhelmed. I love this campaign. It is so much fun. And uh, all the things that are Midgard and Dan uh, just standing ovation from over here on the way you wove that together. So you can find me at tall squall all over social media. I do lots of things. Um, but uh, let these other folks talk. Hell yeah, awesome. Uh, well, let's go to old cast and new cast. So, McLoken. How is that, McLoken? Hi, I'm McLoken. You might recognize me from How to Train Your Blink Dog, and my friend just knocked <laughs> off over all, over all my food. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was... Uh, it, this was really great. What I loved about this was that, like... I felt like the first season, like, uh, uh, you know, we're on that hiatus and like we're so either like it was a sequel to a movie or like, you know, uh, continuing where everything left off. And it's just like if you didn't know anything from the past story, Reardon is just like now a drunk and then you got like 
uh, cloak training, you know, with his like dog, and and then you have Glaz, who's you know doing nerd shit, um, <laughs> which cloak is partly doing as well. Um, and then, then I loved uh, listening to the backstories and like, uh, 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 everyone knew and how they're going to get introduced. And I, I also agree with, uh, tall squall on, uh, the fact that I, I want to give that description of where he is at. Like if, if they run into glass and cloak first and they're like, we're looking for Reardon, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> or else at the fuck house, uh, and then yeah. everyone's gonna be like, <laughs> <laughs> "Fuck house season two. Um, so, uh, yeah, but uh, it was it was really great, and I like I like how things are tying in, and you know the last Oscar and 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 all that kind of stuff, and like with the the world tree actually now burning, uh, and what happened last time, dude. I'm so I want to know what the fuck is going on. Like I want to, and like ah, <laughs> okay, that's me. Uh, you guys can catch me. Uh, for, uh, I'm a uh, I do a D and D show on Wednesdays at uh, Mixer.com/slash/StoryQuest. Uh, I uh, I run that weekly. Um, that's a fantastic uh, homebrew campaign I made out of my head. Uh, another show I like to shout out is uh, The King's Hustle, which is here on Thursday nights. Uh, my uh, wonderful girlfriend, Metamancer, uh, GMs that one, and she does a fantastic job. But actually, does writing for City of Mist now. Uh, and then uh, watching her uh, create uh, the the Fortunes Row uh, is really uh, really awesome, and actually seeing it played out um, is super fantastic. So you guys should check that out Thursday nights uh, and come uh, support that show as well. And that's me. Yeah, just to add to your point, it's totally the, uh, the the two towers, right? To the Fellowship of the Ring. Season one, Fellowship of the Ring, get everything set up. Two towers, shit goes fucking crazy, and everything burns. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fucking hyped for it. Uh, and, of course, with some fantastic new characters. Loved the backstories, as always. Uh, it was a treat getting to, uh, to see more of those. So uh, let's go to Scarlet Moth. How was that tonight? Oh, my mind has just been absolutely blown away by this uh, just that storytelling i'm loving it and uh, i'm very interested to see uh, what it's going to be like when uh, tilly and rowan find their prey and then realize oh it's a drugged up sexed Me up vampire <laughs> uh, i definitely didn't expect rowan to turn out quite the way she did i was expecting a but a neutral wise woman bird but not i wasn't expecting her to be metal as fuck <laughs> i love it <laughs> love it so where can people find you uh so you can find me on i'm mainly on twitter at that scarlet moth um i'm also on facebook and a bunch of the other social medias you can look up scarlet moth and you'll find me uh i do lots of art cosplay and dnd related things uh every uh trying to time zones um Sunday morn Monday morning, I think it's uh, Monday night my time, Australian time. That's yeah, Monday morning uh, I will, time. Yeah, yeah, I will be on a show uh, over on All Mighty Tales, which is an all Australian D and D stream. So I'm very excited to start playing in that. And of course, this this show has uh, I'm I'm hooked already. I can't so wait to find out what happens. It's going to be awesome. Episode two is uh, perhaps even going to be better than episode one. Um, just getting us all together is uh, is going to be really fun. <laughs> it's just always fun figuring out how relationships are going to work between characters and just how destructive they will be. Uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, simply, Jackson, how was that tonight? Uh, I had a extremely fun time tonight. Um, I am still nervous, but still excited. Um, two things you'll learn about me is I'm really bad at a Scottish accent, and I'm really bad at outros, so this will be fine. Um, I uh, accent should do this outro. <laughs> <laughs> Just you got, got, you got to be branding. <laughs> I, it, it has already gone, and my dog disagrees, so no. Um, but anyways, uh, you can find me at simply underscore Jackson. Shut up! And uh, I do a variety of broadcasting, art, games, all sorts of stuff. I am um, involved with a couple of um, 
tabletop campaigns and we'll put it on there too as well as twitter without the uh underscore which is here so um thanks for watching thanks for all my like donut people for showing up i don't know if you guys are um encounter roleplay fans before but i hope you are now and i hope you continue to come back so. oh and thank you i so just want to say oh, sorry no, I had a great time listening to your story building and intertwining everything tonight. So thank you, thank you, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad you, you two joined us. Uh, and I want to say I love your accents. You guys were worried about them. I absolutely love them. So as long as you are comfortable keeping them up, I want more. Yes. Um, so I, before we I turn the, the last bits of this over to Will, I just want to say that um, Cobalt Press will be represented at Gamehole Con in Madison, Wisconsin, coming up next week. I will be there, uh, as will Megan Miracle, who is the one wonderful developer who worked on the Creature Codex. She edited, developed, and made awesome over 400 new monsters for 5th for edition. So if you guys are going to be at Gamehole Con or thereabouts, and you would like to come say hi, we will be there working the booth and doing some panels, and, and we'd love to see you. Uh, also, next week-ish, I think, uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys that Dungeon of the Mad Mage for uh, from Wizards of the Coast is coming out, but I uh, got to get my first official D&D work in in that book. So I wrote one of the levels of Under Mountain, uh, and I would really appreciate hey. it if you guys would check it out. I wrote uh, level 22, Shadow Dust Cold. Well, live stream no, it here. Uh, <laughs> actually, it needs to be a live stream game together. About that. I, I started doing that like three months ago when it was announced, and then I forgot. But now I've been reminded, and now I want to do even more. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have that on the channel soon, I'm sure, uh, to, to, to play through some art. That's fucking awesome! Um, Oh yeah, oh, one point you said about Megan, uh, I did a series of interviews with the Cobalt Press team, which is out uh, this week on YouTube channel, uh, oh, in which awesome. we talk about uh, Midgard and monsters, and it's, it's, it's all good shit, so keep an eye on our YouTube channel, and all our stuff's going out uh, very shortly, it's coincided with the release of this season, but uh, tomorrow is goodness knows what day it is, Wednesday tomorrow, uh, we start at 1pm with Call of Cthulhu, then 4 o'clock with Warhammer, then 7 o'clock with Star Trek, and uh, we'll see what else we, we put in there uh, as well. But yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a busy day as a Wednesday. Uh, we're going to go host some great friend of ours. Her name is Miss Magitech. She's doing Lolf inspired cupcakes right now uh, on, uh, uh, on her channel. So uh, definitely have where's, to go and check where's that out. Where's my Tia Simmer when you need her? Yeah, yeah and Tia is, is so on <laughs> brand. She needs, to be, she needs to be in this one. Uh, but uh, enjoy the stream. Until next time, my friends. Try not to throw too many now ones. I want to be here laughing when you do. <laughs> <laughs> and laughter. Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 Oh fuck! My stuff isn't working. Oh no! Oh, no. Oh, <laughs>